First, there was a dream. Now, there is reality. Here in the untainted cradle of fanboysanonymous.com is episode 0011 of A Review to a Kill, which is a look back on the James Bond series, with this episode focusing on Moonraker. A very out of this world film, you could say. I am your host, Tony Mango. And there's never a 70-year-old around when you need one, but I do have my co-hosts here. I'm looking for Robert DeFelice. Welcome to the world of tomorrow. (laughs) And in distinguished company wearing a gas mask is Callum Wiggins. Oh, sorry, I'm so late. I fell out of a plane without a parachute. (laughs) (laughs) You must excuse me, Callum. Not being English, I sometimes find your sense of humor rather difficult to follow. <laughs> it's fine. Needs to go down a few. Uh, needs to go down a few strands of the evolutionary train. <laughs> then you could be uh, you could be French like Drax and just be above everybody. <laughs> I will always have afternoon tea. <laughs> We're so going to talk about that line. <laughs> Before we get started, let me remind everyone that if you're enjoying the series, show us some love, hit the like button on YouTube, share this on social media, make sure you're subscribed and you follow the channel and the Facebook and Twitter, uh, ring the little notification bell as well. Help us grow by donating to the Patreon or hit the join button on YouTube. That's been properly set up at this point. We're recording this in advance, of course, on the uh, 14th of March. So you're hearing this well into April, if not May. At this point, I'm not entirely sure exactly when the output is. So uh, maybe even some more stuff has been set up like that. We might have the applause button by then. I don't know, 100%. But the more support that we have, the more content that we can bring you all. So if you like what you see on the site and the channel, a dollar a month is a bargain for all the stuff that we're giving you, even if it's just this podcast. But we're giving you more than that. I'm sure at this point that we've done some movie reviews for some of the things that have come out on HBO Max and stuff. So a dollar a month, five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, whatever it might be, the different bonus features, things to pick your poison tier, help us out here and uh, show us that you, uh, that you're enjoying what we're giving you guys. Also a reminder, tell us your thoughts on Moonraker by leaving a comment below, tweeting at us and so on and so forth. You know, the score by now you've listened to plenty of our podcasts. You should at the very least. And if not go back in time for 10 years and listen to all, (laughs) sort out all that stuff. Before we uh, get into the movie itself, we're going to do the things that we've done, you know, here and there quite a bit. Uh, We're going to talk about the title and the foreign language titles and the alternate titles and different things. There's actually a lot this time around uh, that I think are kind of interesting because, you know, with a thing like Moonraker, you can't translate that into every language and just have it be... Kind of like the man with the golden gun. It was pretty easy. They're like, oh, the man with the golden pistol. The man with the gun that happens to be golden and whatever. Uh, they, this time around, it's just sort of whatever. So um, here are some of the ones. We've got uh, Moonrise in Hungary. Moonraker Top Secret in Germany. Right. A lot of the ones that they did, they kind of just added something like that. Like Italy's is Moonraker Operation Space. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like gives me the impression that it's just like imagine yes. like he goes to M's office and he's like uh, he hands him one of those folders that says uh, OHMSS on it and he opens it up and the dossier says space <laughs> your operation for this mission is space check it out <laughs> there's uh, Argentina's is Moonraker mission in space the Soviet Union is Moon Racer because I guess they were like Go I don't know what that racer. means. Yeah. Go moon race. <laughs> um, Taiwan is one of my favorite ones. Space City. <laughs> <laughs> Turkey's got the most boring sounding one of them all. Campaign Moon. Yeah, not great. Like pamphlets. <laughs> That's all it is. Well, the moon's uh, not even involved. Yeah, I know it's Moonraker, but there's no moon actually there's, in the entire movie. <laughs> they don't go to the moon at all. No. Uh, Brazil and Portugal have uh, basically the same because Portuguese is, you know, the, the main language between both. One is 007 and the Death Rocket. The other one is 007 against the Death Rocket. So he fights a Death Rocket in this one. 
<laughs> bare bones, uh, you know, fist with a rocket of death. And then the Chinese one to me seems like this like wacky farce. 007 seizes the space station. <laughs> Other titles for the book originally were The Moonraker Sense, The Moonraker Secret, The Moonraker Plan, The Moonraker Plot, Bond and the Moonraker. And then we start getting weird alternatives The Infernal Machine. Yes. The Inhuman Element. That sounds like fun. Wide of the Mark. Like, what? Not even wide off the mark? Wide of the mark? <laughs> Hell is here. Uh, uh, have you never heard of the phrase wide of the mark? No. Is that a phrase? I've only heard wide no, off the mark. That is a very, very common British expression. Oh, okay. So that makes sense then. Yeah. Well, uh, all right. Explain it. <laughs> yeah. What is that wide of the your- mark? It means just you're off target. Oh, so they you just changed wide, that. You shot wide of the mark. Yeah, you shot wide of the mark. So then when it gets translated over to the uh, American um, linguistics, it's wide off the mark. That's why I was like, oh, why is it wide of the mark? That's so weird. We, we added like, an extra F, that's all. Like, that see, it makes sense, sense to us. Because then it's you're, it you're off the mark, like you didn't go on the mark. the mark. Yeah, but I would I would kind of just say like off the mark then. Why'd you have to be wide off the mark as well? It's like wide of the mark means that it's like you're wide of it. I don't know why you'd use the word off in that sense. It just feels completely bizarre to me. To Since we say that you when you hit a target, it's you you went on target. So if you're not on target, you're off target. So you're mm-hmm. wide off the mark. But even then, like, what does that have to do with the fucking moonraker? <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, ah, he didn't come close to the target. What target? He's flying around in space. Like, <laughs> well, in the book, I think it's actually just a rocket. But even then, I don't know, because this apparently doesn't have like anything to do with the book. Again, never read it. Um, so there's hell is here. You've never learned how to read, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> like some characters. There's also too hot to handle, and. Hold. My absolute favorite out of all the ones from the foreign language titles or the book titles, Mondays are hell. <laughs> I just imagine this book starts off with, uh, sounds like somebody's got a case of the moon days. <laughs> Bond wakes up and he's like, I'm hungover. Sunday was last night. It was pretty rough. Uh, taglines for this movie. There's Moonraker is out of this world. And they really liked this out of this world thing because then they also did the girls are out of this world. And then they also did the villains are out of this world. So it's like, are you going to do the 007 elements that we're breaking out? Are we going to do Moonraker is out of this world? The girls are out of this world. The villains are out of this world. The gadgets are out of this world. The humor is out of this world. Like, And they also have um, where all the bond, all the other bonds end, dot, dot, dot. This one begins. Huh? And then there's Outer Space Now Belongs to 007. <laughs> I love them. There it is. <laughs> it's, it's Bonds now. Bond owns space. It's all, it's all Bonds. Uh, space City, owned by Bond. Rocket of Death? Fuck you, oh, Bond got it. 007, he seized that space station because uh, he's, he's not wide of the mark. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, we could have had all those different titles instead of Moonraker, but they went with Moonraker, like the book. So, um, Outer Space belongs to Bond. Yeah, <laughs> Just, <laughs> it's mine now. <laughs> Let's start off with the gun barrel. Pretty standard here. Thankfully, no funky music since John Barry is back this time. You know how these uh, openings tend to go. This is the third or so time that we've been introduced to a ship of sorts that gets abducted. This time, it's a, it's a, it's a rocket ship. Ten points if anybody gets that reference. <laughs> if you do, leave it in the comments below. <laughs> M gets word and asks uh, Money Penny if 007 is back from his job. She says that he's on his last leg, and we get a cut to Bond caressing a woman's leg. <laughs> it's like, 
Sorry, I, I know, I know it progressed a little bit. But can we go back to the shuttle on the commercial jet? Yeah. So when has anybody ever in human history transported something on commercial jet by having it on the fucking roof of a plane? Then. <laughs> Surely that is against the actual rules of, like, whatever rules determine how you can actually fly things by putting a fucking rocket on top of it. <laughs> You know, they do this in um, Superman Returns, so, too, yeah, where it's like yeah, a spaceship on top of a 747. <laughs> yeah, but it's not like camping equipment that you put on top of your car or anything like yeah. that. Like, you kind of need you kind of need it to be a certain sort of aerodynamic shape in order for it to actually get in the air and work properly. Yeah, but I don't no, know how. I don't know how any of that works. <laughs> I'm assuming I'm it doesn't. One, just one thing. Of course, this movie is full of things like that, which I will be putting out, but... Like, <laughs> Even though those basic things, like, no, you do not carry, you can't carry a shuttle on top of a plane like that. Just, uh, we'll get like, we're into a load of that stuff, but we'll move on. Like, how, the many, theory... how many Star Wars films are we in by, by the time this film comes out? One. I mean, the first one, right? Yeah, 77. Just the first one? First yeah. One. And like we had mentioned before, when we did our um, Spy Who Loved Me, they were planning on doing the uh, Free Rise only, and then the whole big blow up from Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Star Wars and uh, they were just kind of like, well, let's, let's capitalize on that. So Space. we see eventually later on that there's a scene in particular that's very much just like, do Star Wars, you know? <laughs> but I guess in some fashion they thought that this would work. If you're somebody who knows more about aerodynamics and stuff, drop a comment below and tell us if there's any remote chance that this is happening. Cause I, I can't imagine that that's a possibility. Uh, you know, I don't know. Any space belongs to Bond now, so it's all possible. He makes the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, uh, with his, um, magic crotch, he can pull it off. That's so a this, real rocket ship. This is a copy and paste from the last film. It's, you know, exactly the same. Something gets uh, stolen. M says to Money Penny, "Where's Bond?" Money Penny jokes about where Bond is, and the joke is that he's about to have sex. It's literally the exact same thing, including that the action sequence that follows up involves falling from a great uh, height and using a parachute. It is a full-on copy and paste of *The Spy Who Loved Me*, which is a lot in this movie. Um. Interestingly enough, though, the death or the killing that happens there is the 100th kill for James Bond in these films. Huh. He doesn't kill a whole lot of people in this movie, but a lot of people do die in the movie from somebody else's hands. <laughs> you know, he actually doesn't even use his gun in this movie. He doesn't fire his uh, Walther. It's kind of no, weird. We're, we're in space now. Yeah. You got to fire something else. And be low. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> and not just his penis. <laughs> fires that off for sure uh, backtracking to that when he's feeling up her leg she says any higher and my ears will pop <laughs> and, and there's this one goofy looking goon who fights with Bond while the woman casually puts on her parachute and we don't bother with her again we never see her jump out of the plane we never see what happens to her the, the guy pops up and starts fighting and then she disappears from the plane which is just you now she evaporates, I guess. I don't know. They're close to space. Bondo in space. Maybe he uh, <laughs> eradicated she what, her. She, she did what she had to do and she returned home safely. <laughs> she pulled a poochie. <laughs> 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 I have to go now. My planet needs me. <laughs> My planet needs me. <laughs> um, On the way back to her planet, she died. Yeah. <laughs> there goes Apollo Air Hostess. <laughs> Uh, which I had referred to on our chart because we've got uh, spreadsheets going on. I didn't know what her character name was officially called. It's Apollo Air Hostess, apparently. I just referred to her as um, like leggy girl on an airplane or something, I think. Anyway, Bond knocks the one dude out of the plane, but surprise, Jaws is also there. Didn't see that coming, right? Where he just pops up out of the plane, too. They, he replaces the girl. So there's this good looking woman who doesn't exist anymore and Jaws is there instead. He pushes Bond out and uh, there's this great action sequence where Bond eventually catches up to the first guy. He just kind of forces himself to go speedy uh, down into the guy and wrestles with him and steals his parachute. 
and I love how the guy screams. He's just like, ah, ah, kind of like, <laughs> um, Jaws almost bites Bond's leg, but nope. And we eventually get this goofy bit where Jaws pulls his chute and it rips off and he falls into a circus tent with this like music playing and the kind of thing and whatever. I'm not the biggest fan of the joke. Um, I mean, it's better than... Jaws is a bit of a clap in this movie. He really is. They... They got those notes from the last one where people were like, oh, I really like Jaws. How come he can't be a good guy? And they're like, I know. He's a klutz now. And Standard booking of a big man, isn't it? Like, Yeah, it's a big, it's a big show uh, booking, 100%. Yeah. Can we talk about the fact that, obviously, after he steals the parachute, I do like the whole sequence. I think it's really awesome in the air, all those aerial yeah. shots they got. Um, the, the thing that threw me off a little bit is the, the guy, the stuntman they got to play Jaws. Now, I know you're not actually going to walk around and find too many seven foot five guys that are willing to jump out of a parachute, jump out of a plane. But this guy's about half his size. He's clearly a different ethnicity to to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to uh, Richard Keel. <laughs> like, he's got this, like, he's got some sort of, the only thing that he's got in common with Jaws is that he's got slightly bigger teeth. And, and he's it, wearing like, suspenders. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like he's wearing the same sort of outfit, but it, other than that, it's so obvious that that's not Jaws. At least the bomb guy looks like if if you're moving fast enough, you can just you can kid yourself on thinking that's not Roger Moore diving out of a plane, or you you can fool yourself on thinking that is Roger Moore. The other guy just like yeah, that's definitely not Jaws. It's just some guy we found who's willing to jump out of a plane and do this stuff. Well, they ended up having to do this eighty eight times over the course of five weeks to get the thing because uh what the way that they had to film this was they needed a camera that could be strapped on and it had to be a certain weight and everything uh it's mostly all shot just like in free fall which i find like really impressive that they were able to pull this off so each time it was like all right get up there and jump and we've got three seconds worth of film get back up there, do another jump, that kind of thing. Like, it took right, 88 jumps. Like Less, uh, I mean, uh, more attempts to do that than to get uh, Kananga to jump on the alligators. But I like this whole bit. I think that that's a better stunt than the parachute stunt. And a really cool action sequence. It looks a lot better overall then you know i mean we're well past the era of connery in front of a terrible green screen just to be able to like drive you know yeah <laughs> where he's doing the whole like moving the wheel like le- left and right and you know now it looks at least somewhat realistic because i mean they for the most part they did it yeah for the most part they don't actually cut to moore's face or yeah Moore's face but when they do it looks awful there's one shot in this movie in particular that's really bad when they cut to Jaws and when he jumps on the from the, the two cable cars. That's one of my least favorite shots in the entire film. So let's talk about the main theme. Shirley Bassey's back. Moonraker is a song that I like a lot, but when I'm ranking it with these other ones, it's just outclassed by a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, especially some of the later ones that we're going to get to, like if you will kill and golden eye and uh, both songs from tomorrow never dies and everything. It's just sort of, it's a good song, but it's not one of the better bond themes. How do you guys feel about the, the main theme? Yeah, it wasn't great. It'll probably end up down the lower end. I like, like it's a good song, but as Tony said, it's just outclassed. It's clearly the weakest of the Bassy trilogy. And it makes no fucking sense. Thank you. It doesn't <laughs> make any that sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. It talks about gold. There's no gold in this movie. It talks about how it's all about love and all the other stuff. And I know the Bond, the more series of Bond films is more about the romantic themes and that side of it. So I can kind of place it there. But it makes no, it absolutely has no context with the movie. You kind of feel like they only gave Shirley Bassey a title and absolutely no idea what the movie was about and she yeah. had to work with what she got. <laughs> 
Yeah, for anybody the film, yeah, her wrote the um song, as I, sh- I should say. For anybody she, who she doesn't know, and just went with it. What the lyrics are here? Here's the, the spoken. I'm not gonna sing it. Um, <laughs> spoken version of the lyrics. Where are you? Why do you hide? Who? What? <laughs> Where is that moonlight trail that leads to your side? Now, maybe you can go with the idea of like, oh, okay, like it's like a romantic moon kind of setting and yeah. you're trying to go with the love angle. But then it goes, just like the moonraker goes in search of his dream of gold. So moonraker is not a thing. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a ship. So it's the name of a show. Yeah. Like if you try to say like the, the space shuttle goes, okay. But then in search of his dream of gold it's not a person and there's nothing about gold in the movie like Callum said let alone it's not like the ship is looking for gold in space so <laughs> it's... I have a theory that they just went surely get in there and do your thing and you, you know what you're doing the gold finger go with that but make it Moonraker she's like where are you diamonds are forever <laughs> Where is Goldfinger? <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. which is, it's just again, it's not like Shirley Bassey is any way a bad singer, but it's just so left field for her because the mm-hmm. other two songs are just like they're all big and powerful and they really emphasize the power of her voice. And this song is just so muted. It's something that really could have been done by somebody else. I mean, I, I'm glad that she does it. She's got a great voice and everything like that, but. You know, when you get her with uh, with Goldfinger being the whole, he loves gold, and it's like, ah, like, you know, the glass shattering kind of a thing, and it's awesome. And I still think The Diamonds Are Forever is, like, one of the better songs. This one's very low-key, and they probably would have been better off getting somebody different just to kind of be, like, bring a little bit more attention to somebody else. Because this feels more like Nancy Sinatra's You Only Live Twice to Me. Where they could have gotten somebody who's big at the time. I don't know who would have been a big star in 1979. Um, actually, let me try to look at that. Uh, biggest musician stars in 1979. See if something comes up with that. Donna Summer. Uh, Donna Summer, Blondie, Michael Jackson, Kenny Rogers. God, imagine Kenny Rogers doing this. Because <laughs> <laughs> they, they got someone like the, the Rolling Stones or someone to do something like this or. Well, got Paul McCartney last time, so they could, well, not last time, but a few things ago, so maybe the Rolling Stones would have step up. Funny enough, uh, Frank Sinatra was offered the part of Drax with the idea in mind that they were going to have him do the title song, and it was going to be called Think of Me. So there's a parallel universe out there where Sinatra is playing the main villain, and he's also singing a version of this song. Can we check that one out? How do we get there? <laughs> Just uh, could you could you imagine Bond and the main villain doing a big dance and Broadway music <laughs> number in the middle? Yeah. Of yeah. That? Uh, Bee Gees were popular around this time. They were number nine on this chart for top artists in 1979. Earth, Wind, and Fire, ABBA. I don't even know who some of these are. Super Tramp, uh, <laughs> Electric Light Orchestra. I probably know some of the people's you know songs or whatever. Know, don't you? Uh, shine a little love. Don't bring me down. This way is don't bring me down. The don't bring me down. Is it that one? There's the last yeah. train to London. I don't know that confusion. I don't know that. Uh, the the police shit. I've been saying for the longest time. Sting, Sting needs to do a Bond theme. God, and the fact that he hasn't is a little weird. The fact that I know Billie Eilish is popular, but the fact that Billie Eilish is doing one and Sting hasn't seems wrong. I'd like to hear a Sting what? version of Moonraker. I think that could be really good. What's what's the obsession of Sting having to do a song, a Bonza? I just think that he is a great songwriter. For it. And he would do a damn good song. Like, I mean, it's weird to say Sting is British and he's been around a long time and he's been really popular and he has a wide variety of different songs. He hasn't done a Bond theme, but he's done the main theme of a Lethal Weapon movie. Isn't that weird? And I love that song. It's one of my favorite songs. It's probably he doesn't want to do a Bond thing. 
Maybe not. They might have approached him at some point. Maybe he's too busy with other things, but, you know, we can dream. He's busy saving Bart. (laughs) So that's, yeah, uh, the Moonraker goes in search of his dream of gold. I search for love for someone to have and hold. Some of these lyrics are pretty good. They they don't fit, but... um, the, I search for love for someone to have and hold. I've seen your smile in a thousand dreams, felt your touch, and it always seems you love me. Okay, I like that. Where are you? Where? When will we meet? Take my unfinished life and make it complete. Just like the Moonraker knows, his dream will come true someday. I know that you are only a kiss away. I've seen your smile in a thousand dreams, felt your touch, and it always seems you love me. You love me. I'm like, yeah, I, you know, for a, a non-Bond theme where you take the Moonraker line out of it, it's a hell of a song. I like it a lot. And the visuals are a step up, I think. They play around a little bit more with the effects. They got this dreamy, floaty kind of vibe, low gravity sort of thing, which I think is pretty great, too. And I they... Uh... Go ahead. I was going to say, I, th- I thought the opening titles were terrible. Yeah. Really? They're, absolutely, really they're, totally unmemorable. they're totally unmemorable. Like, I can't... I, I can... Based on my notes, I can basically have a picture of it, but if I didn't have my notes in front of me, I'd have no idea what they were. They don't stand really? out as being, like, really innovative. I just think that they look crisper i, 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 I did not like the one with the girl flying and then all of a sudden she <laughs> freezes in the that was like really weird oh, oh you're talking about the, the plane one i was talking about the one that like stops like floats and then stops completely in midair and then it's just pulled off the screen down the bottom <laughs> just, <laughs> just, yeah it's just i think it's really bad like it's got absolutely none of the character or charm of the um the spy who loved me one this feels very much like we have to insert Bond into a trend. And I don't I don't like it. The budget for the effects for the opening title sequence was more than the entire budget of Doctor Now. That's awesome. And the uh this movie's budget was more than every other film beforehand combined. <laughs> no. But it managed to be the highest grossing Bond film of all time all the way up until Goldeneye. So they made their money back. Get the fuck out. Up until Goldeneye? Yeah. It's it's a space movie. And people, and that was the hot trend at the time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't surprise me that it goes down beyond this point because Moore was getting too old and so he probably lost its appeal. And Michael Moore Loeb and the Dalton movies were not, like, at that point, people were thinking that Bond was out, essentially. All right. That fact alone makes me feel like I'm going to love these Dalton films even more and they're just super underrated. They really are, I think. They're just, yeah, easily it's, it's two of my favorites. With, it's got nothing to do with the qualities of the movie. I mean, I haven't yeah. seen them, but I'm sure they are good. But it's just a case of the fact that Bond had been going for 20 plus years at that point, and probably people thought it was stale. Yeah, and it needed the refresher when it came to Goldeneye, because they end up having a bigger stretch of time in between then. Plus, we're getting hokier with this kind of error. And, I mean, you know, something like Star Wars comes out. And then people are like, we want to see another Star Wars thing. And then when you get to the next movie, you're going to see a big change back to like, we're going down to the grittier type of thing. And then people didn't really like that. Um, so let's go to M's office. Money Penny asks uh, Bond why he's late. He tells her the truth. He's like, uh, fell out of an airplane with parachute. And she doesn't believe him. <laughs> Later on, we call get a call back to that, too. Um, MQ and the Minister of Defense from the last film, Sir Frederick Gray, inform Bond that the Moonraker shuttle's been hijacked and the government was responsible for transporting it, and now it's their ass, basically. Uh, it's like, you know, typical Bond. What do you know about Moonraker? Oh, the Moonraker was created on this, and this is what happens <laughs> like that, because he knows everything, of course. But M... Surprisingly, not all like, well, of course you know about fucking shuttles, dick. <laughs> like, no, I've, no, I've kind of got the theory, or not maybe not a theory, but a feeling that they've, they're they putting Frederick Gray in the angry role now. Yep. He's the one that hates Bond, and M is the one that kind of defends him a bit more. Yeah. Which I kind of like the dynamic a bit more. Yeah. It's weird how things change in this series, because M goes from, he's a little stern, to well, he's somebody who clearly likes Bond because in uh, From Russia with Love, Bond's uh, when they're listening to the tape and Bond's like, oh, there's this one time that Em and I were hanging out and he's just like, oh, okay, we don't need to hear about that. So it's like they've been up to some shenanigans. 
And then by the time you get to Goldfinger, the third film, he's just like, I fucking hate you. And then <laughs> for a good stretch of movies, it's just like, I hope you die. I, you, of course, you know, butterflies and like all this other kind of stuff. But he does get considerably uh, more smoothed over in this one. By the time we get to License to Kill, he has some problems with him again, but then it's okay. And then we get to Judy Dench and she's like, I mean, she literally has the line, I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. <laughs> so <laughs> then they're just like, fucking hates him again. And then she loves him again in the next movie and all that. So it's very, you know, uh, each M hates and loves their bond in different moments. Uh, he doesn't really like when Bond gets his gadget though, because Q gives him this uh, wrist dart gun thing that you twist your wrist in a certain way and it shoots out some kind of a dart and one of them's armor piercing, the other one's uh, cyanide coated. Bond shoots M's painting of King William the Third right in the horse's ass and he just goes, thank you. And uh, Bond's got a little line where he just says, oh, this is great. And Q, that should be uh, in stores for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like so it's a wrist powered dart gun so essentially what would happen if Craven the Hunter and Spider-Man had a baby <laughs> yeah <laughs> kind of so so yeah that's uh, that's what I kind of took out of that one I also the one another thing I did take out slightly earlier is the fact that and I don't want to sound harsh with, when saying this as well but Bond in two years looks like he's aged about five yeah. So, and the man penny, is under money eyes, penny, so money penny is now, stress. And money penny's looking pretty mature now. It's, it doesn't really feel right if Bond is flirting with her. Or to be fair, this block Bond can flirt with her because he's probably still older than she is. But it's like, but um, it feels more like your your grandparents flirting with you, like doing flirty stuff. Like, oh, grandma, stop it! It's just like rather than that, rather than like feeling a bit cute about it. Think about yeah, this. Money Penny aged a lot in this film. Think about this. Moore has three more movies. I know. So he's looking pretty, you know, Money up Penny there in Penny. age. And Money yeah, Penny. same Money Penny has three movies too. And um, the next movie, not to spoil too much, the next movie flat out addresses his age. The movie after that doesn't. So he's even older and it doesn't. And he flirts with a very young uh, woman in that one, too. And by the time you get to the last one, where he's as old as he gets in the series, he's his Bond girl's like 20-something. And we're going to get into Stacey Sutton and how weird that relationship is. But this is when you really start noticing, like, we're aging pretty quickly and... But it, it, it's especially counterpointed by the point, but by the fact that M and Q look exactly the same. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> like, for the most part, Q, once he reached, like, you only live twice, he pretty much stayed that way. And when we get through to The World's Not Enough, he does age more, of course, because everybody ages more. Um, more ages more. <laughs> and, sure uh, you know, there's... um. Some people, of course, age more gracefully than others. And, you know, you get like a Jane Seymour who I, I saw a picture of her the other day. Um, again, we're recording this on March 15th. I saw a picture of her that she I guess she must have turned 70 pre pretty recently. And she was just like on the beach wearing like a, a one piece. And I'm like, still looking great. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> just one of those things. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to talk about age for two other things in this movie. Uh First, before we get into that, though, um, generally speaking, how do you guys feel about the wrist dart gun? Because I like it, but at the same time, I think it's in incredibly impractical. Because you twist your wrist in a certain way, and you're going to shoot a dart at someone. You know, I think it it serves its purpose. It's fun, because it seems like somebody with Bond's control should be fine with it. <laughs> wrist control. So like, it's like, <laughs> you know, somebody else will... Accidentally turn it on themselves and boop. How about you, Callum? You uh, you pro or con the wrist dart gun? Um, I mean, it had it had its use. It kind of felt like it had been forgotten a little bit throughout the course of the movie. But I think as a weapon, it's it's fine. 
it's like it's nice and concealed it makes sense to have it as like standard issue yeah i'm, I'm not I, I can't say it's like the best gadget we've seen so far but it's certainly not one of the worst ones we'll come back to it uh twice more yeah two more times actually gets more use out of it than a lot of the other bond uh, gadgets do in this era so bond goes to meet the man behind the moonraker hugo drax uh who has employed a very beautiful helicopter pilot, Corrine Defour. You guys notice anything interesting about Corrine? Was I supposed to? Possibly. No. She has the distinct honor of being the last person dubbed by Nikki Vanderzil. And unfortunately, not only is that the last part that she played in the series, uh, the, since we last did our previous one, she passed away March 6th. So again, you know, we're recording this on March uh, 14th. 14th. Uh, that, uh, was something that Rob and I discovered the other day when we were just kind of looking up some information and stuff after a different podcast. And we were recording, what were we were recording. Was that like I the Pokemon was, thing or something? No, no, it was the hot tags. Oh, the hot tags. That's right. Hot tags, uh, 484. We're just sort of like, because uh, Rob had just watched uh, Moonraker, so we were just kind of chit-chatting about it, and we, uh, I started looking up at Nikki Vanderzel, and I'm like, oh my god, she just died, like, right after we uh, recorded the Spy Who Loved Me one. So that sucks. Because, <laughs> I mean, at this point, you guys are hearing these well after we're recording them, so it's going to be like an entire month worth of... Nikki Vanderzel, she's still around. And then it's like, uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, so, R.I.P. Nikki Vanderzel. Um, yeah, I mean, is iconic with all these films that she's been in. And it sucks because I know you had mentioned in a previous podcast that you were hoping maybe they got her in something for No Time to Die. Just a quick roll just to acknowledge her. Yeah, and so no, I don't see that being a part of the casting, so maybe not. Um, the story behind Corrine Dufour, now, she's French. Uh, the actress is actually named Corrine as well, not Dufour, but this is supposed to be California. <laughs> and <laughs> what's happening here is they they filmed this in France, and to be able to film it in France they needed to hire a certain amount of French uh, actors and French crewmen and everything. So the character was originally named something else. I forget the name. It was, I don't know, like a Kelly Smith, like some kind of like Valley girl, Californian type of thing. And instead they were like, well, you know, we do need to incorporate some more French people. Let's get this French model or French actress or whatever named Corrine and we'll make her uh, Corrine. There you go. They're, they're, like they really didn't think about it twice. And they try to justify the whole French thing. It's like, this doesn't look the slightest bit like California. So they go, uh, Drax's huge mansion estate was moved over from France. He just, you know, picked it up like brick by brick and put it over here and he bought the Eiffel Tower but the French government refused to give him an export permit <laughs> which I was just like kind of lampshading it a little bit I like that I thought that was kind of funny and uh yeah, he's telling us this guy is rich yeah this guy's exposition. rich and he's French <laughs> yeah expo exposition yeah uh, we see some astronauts training that'll be important later pretty decent setup to just you know remind you that like these people are gonna pop up here and there and then we we first see Drax playing a piano in such a weird way that I'm not the only one who used to think that Michael Lonsdale flat out wasn't playing. Did you guys think that when you were saying this, or did that not register to you guys the same? It didn't register, but it also, knowing what we know about these films, wouldn't have surprised me if he just wasn't, you know? Yeah, I, I didn't pay much attention to it. I just was listening to the piano, just saw him sitting there. Didn't really pay too much attention to where his hands were going. It's like uh, the way that the shot moves around his hands, there's like a very active part of the uh, the song, and he you don't see his hands. And by the time you see it, it looks like he's just hovering over the keys and not playing anything. Apparently he is playing, but it's just... 
I think like a different take of it where they, you know, they spun the camera around a little bit quicker or something like that. It's just, it's like optical illusion to me that I'm like, he, he's playing a player piano. He's not playing kind of a thing, but you can actually see him push down keys for like the last couple of notes or so. It's a nice little uh, piece of music. Later on, I'm going to send you guys a link to a song that I absolutely love uh, for the score of this, but that's, I like that piece too. And uh, Drax thinks that Bond's there just to apologize. Like, uh, you know, the government agency sent one of their best guys to just be like, sorry about the Moonraker, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> he jabs at him that uh, afternoon tea is the one contribution that the Brits have offered Western civilization. <laughs> and he says one of my favorite lines in the franchise, may I press you to a cucumber sandwich? <laughs> I mean, in fairness, he does say it's the one indisputable thing that the British have given to a Western culture. So That's I true. Think he's I assume by saying that he's saying that we've kind of bring a lot of stuff into it, but he can say, oh, no, it's actually uh, this civilization that did it instead, whereas offering tea, that's clearly the British way. Have you guys ever had a cucumber sandwich? Specifically, yep. Callum, have you ever had a cucumber sandwich? Yeah, of course. I had, I had not, not just cucumber in my sandwich today, but I had a sandwich today with cucumber. In it. I'm not a fan of cucumber. I, uh, yeah, yeah, me neither. I love cucumber. Cucumber's great. My favorite, uh, well, not my favorite, but it's, it's one of my favorite vegetables to eat. I, to me, uh, cucumber and bread, I can't imagine that that goes well together because the one's just like watery and I, I know like lettuce, of course, is, but I don't know. It just seems, especially for that to be like the main part of the sandwich, because like, what else do you put in it for a cucumber sandwich? It can't just be cucumbers on bread, right? It's cucumber butter and bread usually. Huh. That is about it, yeah. I mean, maybe some people put like salad cream or something like that in there and with the sandwich as well, but the ones that I've had, I, I I'm not a big fan of salad cream or mayonnaise or anything like that, so I would just have it with yeah, butter and cucumber and two bits of white bread. At some point, I'm going to have to try it. Somebody's going to have to press me to it at some point. <laughs> oh, man, it's very much buffet food, so I assume you could get it for your wedding if you wanted to. That's buffet food there too, right? Wow, I wouldn't think that would be the case either. I know so we, we, minute, we, we, it depends. It depends what your buffet is and stuff like that. But if you have like a cold buffet, they usually will give you like an array of sandwiches and stuff like that to to have as part of it. God, Americans are the dialect difference. Callum, did, did you say sour cream or salad cream? Salad, salad cream. So salad. you said salad. So you don't call it salad dressing. You call it salad cream. It's not the same thing. Well, but what is a salad cream? Oh, I thought you meant salad dressing. Yeah, uh, salad cream. I don't, I don't know what you call it over there because I knew that was going to be a point of issue. That it doesn't translate over. I don't know what the American version of it is. I can't put it that way. It's essentially like, it's. I don't know if it is like. And I know it's not the same as salad dressing, but it's some sort of like mayonnaise type cream that you put. You hmm. that, that comes in a squirt bottle, like ketchup or, like mustard or something like that so we have this tony like it's just called salad cream i've just never heard of it until this very day so this is sugar mustard salt thickener spices flavoring and coloring oil water egg yolks vinegar kind of looks a little bit like honey mustard mixed with mayo it's, it's pretty much like that yeah it's like a yellow a very yellowy mayo yeah usually. well i don't I like I don't like vinegar. I don't like, uh, you don't like vinegar? no, I don't like it's to me. Like ketchup is one of the most disgusting smells and everything too. And I don't like mustard. So if you basically take mustard and add vinegar to it, I'm puking. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm never having salad cream. That's for sure. I'm, uh, with my salads, I'm more of like a, um, Actually, I don't think I have like any real salad. Like maybe like a raspberry vinaigrette where you can't really taste the vinegar or something. I'm a big fan of uh, the blue cheese. And I, I'm with Tony in terms of like ketchup being gross, but I think I'd try salad cream. May I press you to a cucumber sandwich? I love that phrase. He's got a lot of really like, he's very eloquent in this movie, almost to a fault where like, 
some of his lines just kind of feel like nobody would ever talk like this, but I, I love it. Um, I also love the bit with the dogs where he tosses the meat and they just sit there until he snaps his finger I like that. What I don't like is the henchman. Chang here. What? <laughs> like, he seems like he's in the wrong film. Yeah. Like, there's a leftover from uh, You Only Left Twice or from uh, The Man with the Golden Gun or, you know. Cause the guy's not even an actor. He's the Aikido instructor of the producer, Michael G. Wilson. The one I mentioned before is a stepson of uh, Cubby Broccoli who helps take over the series and does a bunch of cameos in every single one of them. He does three cameos in this movie. He's uh, two people in Venice and he's a NASA technician. So he's just his Aikido instructor. And he's like, Hey, you want to be in a, a Bond film? You want to be a, one of the main henchmen? <laughs> so you got this French dude, this like aristocrat, and he's just got this ninja hanging out with him. <laughs> what? That's not just, goes to show, just goes to show in the film industry, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. Very much so. And Drax is a straight up bad guy. There's no questions whatsoever that, that he's responsible for this. Because by the time we get to May I Press You to a Cucumber Sandwich, and Bond's like, all right, like, well, I'll see you later. He immediately says, look after Mr. Bond. See that some harm comes to him. <laughs> just, I can't recall a villain being so direct. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah, make sure he gets hurt. Just Chung, uh, fuck him up. <laughs> Bond goes to go on this tour. He finds, uh, he, he goes to find Dr. Goodhead and he sees this beautiful woman. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm looking for Dr. Goodhead. And she says, you just found her. And I All hate right. this. He goes, a woman. Now, thankfully she quips back your powers of observation. Do you credit Mr. Bond? But I mean, at this point, Bond's had like, I mean, Mary Goodnight is an agent. Uh, Paula is an agent. He's had Anya is a, a spy, and plenty of the women in this series they're not presented quite great yet. They're still not really, you know, even in like twenty twenty one. Um, but they're not complete dolts or anything. And he's just like a woman is Doctor Goodhead. I didn't think that that could be okay. Like ah, that's a so, step back. I so I, I'm sure that everything you just said is accurate and it's a step back. But for my sake, I just want to believe that he was hoping for the sake of his magic penis that Dr. Goodhead was not a woman because, you know, he actually just wanted to focus on the mission here. <laughs> and the Dr. Doctor Goodhead, we had talked about this name and I still audibly <laughs> went, what? <laughs> Holly Goodhead. <laughs> Where does this rank on the... Uh, I mean, maybe we'll end up doing a, a list of that at some point, too. We got... I would say at this point, this is number two or number three. It's... Pussy Galore is well, always number one. Tool. Behind Plenty of Tool. Maybe. Yeah. It, it's, there's Pussy Galore, Plenty of Tool, and Holly Goodhead. Like, Honey Rider... Okay, Honey Rider is kind of like... I know where you're going there. And there's, like, Sylvia Ooh. Trench, and you're like... Okay, there's something a little bit to that, but Holly I can Goodhead. Kind of, well, it's 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 different with this one because you just can't imagine somebody having the actual surname Goodhead. No, for sure there is someone that has that surname out there. And apologies to you if you're the one listening to this, but it's just a name that's only made for a sexual innuendo thing. It's mm -hmm. like nobody has the first name Pussy. Nobody has the first name Plenty, especially if their surname's O'Toole. So it's like nobody is calling. Is has got the surname Goodhead. It's just not. <laughs> it's just. It's just a nonsense. And we've got Tiffany Case, but that's like, okay, if your last name's Case, and if your family is really into that kind of stuff, Tiffany's a normal name. Case, not a weird name. And you go with Tiffany Case. I mean, we I've heard weirder names than that. And Mary Goodnight. Mary's a normal name. Uh, Holly is a normal name. Goodnight is like, eh, that's probably not going to be the case. Obviously, Agent Triple X, that's just her code name. Anya Amasova, that's just normal. But Holly Goodhead. I, this, this is totally Felicity Shagwell. And 
you know, a lot of vagina and whatever. It's. I mean, I'm looking up the name Goodhead. It doesn't. It's it's not listed anywhere. Like I'm looking because I want to believe that maybe somebody somewhere might have this name, and maybe it's not just like, hey, Goodhead. Uh, just wow. Looking up Mr. Goodhead, the first thing that pops up for me is Doc Johnson Goodhead Assorted Flavors. Uh, some kind of a drink <laughs> Doc. or something. <laughs> Doc Johnson Doc Goodhead. Goodhead. <laughs> uh, and that it's Holly Goodhead. Like, there's apparently something called Goodhead Oral Delight. Strawberry, four ounces. At Walmart. <laughs> so, yeah, Goodhead. It's just, it, 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 might as well name her Dr. Holly uh, great in the sack or something. <laughs> so he digs at her again, uh, asking if she's training to become an astronaut. And she's like, nah, dude, RDM fully trained at this point. Like if, if you're from her perspective, you're like, what's up with this fucking sexist dick weed. And he's like, Oh, you could be that. Are you training to do this? Whatever. Fuck this dude. You know? No, that's tr- that's true, but I also imagine that there's probably quite a lot of people in the audience, and again, maybe this is me stereotyping and stuff like that, but there's a lot of like older gentlemen in the audience, maybe, who are watching this movie for the first time, and they hear like, and then they see Bond, it's like, oh, I'm Dr. Goodhead, and then uh, they all immediately take off their top hats and throw up. <laughs> a woman? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. A woman? Like, you, you do the, uh, the... Going to space? You do the poll afterward, with like the audience testing kind of thing. To see if you do uh, reshoots, and people are like, you know what? Um, this movie was just not all that believable. And they're like, oh, you didn't think that like Bond could go into space? They're like, no, 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 that's fine. But the a, a what? woman is a doctor. What the? Hell? <laughs> like, this is 1979. What kind of ludicrous crap is this? <laughs> Listen, I was all I was all for Bond being able to wash off radiation. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, a, but a woman hold on you're telling hold me this your... this beautiful woman's an astronaut <sighs> i mean can women even drive <laughs> right can they pull their uh steering wheel and move left to right as quickly as sean connery used to well, i don't think so back in my day that's what we used to make cars that exploded god damn it <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, it's just it's i, I don't like I don't like the exchange of the whole a woman kind of thing because it's like, well, come on, it's 1979. One of the things Bond does on this tour is a test run on a centrifuge, and Holly points out this chicken switch trigger that stops it, and even a 70 year old can take three Gs. He has that line I said earlier, you know, oh, there's not a 70 year old around when you can, uh, when you need one. It's like, well, we can wait a couple of years, <laughs> Roger. Yeah, you're pretty fucking, yeah, I was going to say, you're pretty fucking close to the you're, you're right there, pal. Yeah. There's not a 70 year old, oh, a 60 year old's going to be hopping around with um, Mayday pretty soon. So she leaves the room and we get a variation of that uh, stretch machine scene from Thunderball, but at least it's a little bit more realistic this time. Instead of Bond humping uh, <laughs> the stretch machine, he's, in a centrifuge and uh, Chang ramps things up and disables the chicken switch. So he's just kind of flying around here. It's like, you know, three G's. Anybody could take that. You're going up to like uh, 40, I think is what she says would be fatal. And uh, 20, 20. Uh, he's only able to get out of it by using the wrist dart to take out to the controls, which yeah. pretty good. I don't know how it works, like but. The- yeah. Well, it's just it's a pulse out of his wrist, so it just presses from the inside if he moves his wrist to the side. No, I mean the taking out the controls oh, right. on the panel of that. Like I don't know how that controls the other thing. It's me they. Yeah. <laughs> People are like always the reason. I'll believe this, but that doctor it's like yeah. That woman? No. Uh, did she design this? Like, yeah. Uh I love that uh Moore sells it afterward. He's shaken up, not stirred. <laughs> And uh, Dizzy, he's pissed. He doesn't let Holly help him. Instead of him just being like, no, I'm totally fine. Like, he's actually just kind of like, fuck, you know. It's a lot better than the the Thunderball scene. And it doesn't end with him threatening to get her job taken away from her. <laughs> she doesn't, she doesn't sleep with him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of a step up, I guess. And uh, Bond then casually goes into Kareen's room. She says... 
the stupidest lines in this movie. <laughs> no, it's the best bit. There are some really dumb lines <laughs> in this movie. <laughs> My mother gave me a list of things not to do on a first date. And he says, well, you're not going to need it. That's not what he came for. She's like, no? What do you want then? <laughs> kind of like, you didn't come here to fuck me? That kind of thing. Like, and we'll come back to that line. Um, he kisses her anyway because, you know, he's Bond and she's pretty. And, of course, she's into it because you know, he's Bond and, you know, magic dick and everything. And Bond's like, so uh, what about that list of your mother's? And she says, I never <laughs> learned to read. <laughs> <laughs> on the commentary for this uh, of course the commentary track with Roger Moore is awful because he's just sort of sitting there going oh, we had this lovely soup <laughs> like, and that kind of shit like <laughs> it's the, like I think it's in the Brazil side of things where he's just like oh I like to have a cup of coffee when I wake up in the morning <laughs> and you're like god damn it Roger can you talk about the movie you know but on the commentary track for the box set that I've got where uh they decided to just cram in Michael G. Wilson and I forget who the other two was. It might've been one of the writers and one of the other producers or something. They're just talking over each other and they're arguing with each other and stuff. And it's great. It's, it was fun to listen to this. And Michael G. Wilson's like, this is what it's like when we go on a story retreat. Like they're just kind of like, no, 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 this is better. And this is whatever. And one of them argues, he's like, I hate this line. He's like, why, what the hell does she mean? I never learned to read. It's stupid. Why couldn't she have said, I I burned the list, or I threw it out, or I never bothered to read it. What do you mean she never learned to read? And the other one's like, ah, you know, it's, uh, fuck you, like kind of basically. <laughs> what? I don't dis I don't dislike this line because I can imagine Bond saying it in the sense of like, what well, I'm trying to think of a context of putting it into, but essentially, obviously she knows how to read. That's not the thing that she's trying to get across. She's just basically saying like. Oh, what about your mum's list? Just, she's just making up an excuse in her head about why she's not going to follow that instruction. Yeah, like, but oh, I'm never learning to read. It, it just works so nah, much better. That's, if... less, that's less funny, Callum, than her just being like, I never learned how to read. Oh, oh, well. But like, that's where the rewrite comes in, where somebody goes, oh, I never learned to read. And then you go, wait, she should say, I never read it. Or something. And then you like, because <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get what Callum is saying. Yeah. Though, like, it's, it's it's like a bond quip. Of like, it's funnier that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it just sounds better that way. I think the lines are good. There's I, a lot worse lines in this movie. I think it'd be great if there's a deleted scene where <laughs> Drax hands her like a newspaper and she's like, the the <laughs> like just kind of like trying to sound out things like Officer Bar Brady from uh, <laughs> South Park. One of my favorite lines in that movie, uh, that TV show, is when he's like, m m. What's this word? Or like, I don't know, like pigeon or something where it doesn't even start with an M. <laughs> Never learned to read. Poor Kareen. So he bangs her, of course, because, you know, she's hot and everything and he wants to get information and he just decides to go hunting for info and she's super useful because he's like, where's the safe? And she looks right at it. And he's like, ah, there it is. She's like, James. <laughs> But then she just watches some dude spy stuff. Like, well, come on now, she's clearly not bad and, uh, with a strong brain here. Like, she's uh, she never learned to read. <laughs> come on, like, it's there. And, bon and Bond's working with the latest safe cracking technology. It's an evolution on the previous model. Yeah. It sounds <laughs> like good... fucking pong being played. There's a cigarette case slash uh, X-ray type. Thing which can see the inner workings of the safe and crack it within. And she points it out her chest and sees that she's got a heart of gold. Yeah. Um, He's also got a little camera that has 007 on it. <laughs> With the lens being the middle zero, because, like, why wouldn't you just brand yourself? I mean, this is a spy that tells everybody his name. So he's also got a camera with his code uh, number on it, too. Hi, everybody. I'm a secret agent. Secret being the key here. My name is James Bond. I'm Agent 007, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I've got my pin number tattooed on my ankle as well. Yeah. <laughs> my social security number is whatever. <laughs> this is kind of just... Uh, Sneaky Chang is uh, snooping, watching this whole time. So Kareen's totally fucked in more ways than one. But before we do that, let's go hunting. Uh, Drax and his uh, people are all dressed up for this outing to shoot some pheasant. Because you gotta dress that way to do that, which is ridiculous. 
when they call for a break or whatever they, I don't know what you, if there's like a different phrase for it or whatever, the horn goes, bum, bum, bum. Totally also Sprock, uh, Zarathustra to reference 2001 because space movies. World of tomorrow. At this point, Ric Flair is on Space Mountain, I'm pretty sure, as well. I'm pretty sure he's very close with James Bond, but they share notes, I'm sure. <laughs> Ric Flair's cutting a promo. She never learned to read. <laughs> um, Drax gives Bond a gun, and he's like, come on, shoot a bird. <laughs> yeah. uh, Roger Moore did not like doing this scene at all. He's not a fan of hunting and everything, so good on Roger Moore. He seems like a decent person. Yeah, he seems like a great dude all around. And kind of reminiscent of Thunderball with the clay pigeon thing. He uh, he aims his gun, moves around, shoots, and he hits nothing. Although, in, you know, in, uh, in Thunderball, it's like, oh, this looks really easy, uh, really hard. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. For this one, he shoots, hits nothing. Drax is like, oh, you missed Mr. Bond. And Bond just goes, did I? As you said, such good sport. You see, he's <laughs> shot and killed the sniper. I love that moment. That is a very bomb moment. Uh, yeah, I adored that one. Top notch. That's very like textbook Bond of the. Did I miss? Shot your guy. Here you go. Here's a gun. See you later. By the way, I fucked uh, your assistant. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But Drax knows. He calls out Crane. He's like, you know, you were with Bond last night. You showed him the safe. You're fired. And then six dogs on her. And I love this sequence. It's got this like thriller vibe to it. I love the music. It's one of the more haunting deaths in the series, in my opinion. It made me genuinely uncomfortable. This poor woman runs through the forest and gets mauled by dogs. Yikes. Yeah. (laughs) He had a real, um, maybe only person that thought this one, but uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre vibe. Hmm. In the, the first in the first movie, there's a lot of chasing through the forest and stuff like that, and it's a lot of really good cinematography attached to it. I mean, this one's in broad daylight, so it looks a lot better in that regard. But yeah, it's very, very just like there's so much tension build up in it because you kind of feel like, oh, is she going to get away? They actually let you feel that way rather than it's just like the dogs go after her and then it just cuts away and then you just are left to assume. It's like, no, this is pretty... Like, we're going to build this up as many times as possible. Is Bond going to come in and save her? No, she's just going to get killed by dogs. It's like that's you feel bad for her at the end of it. The music's so good too. It's just like do 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 like building up tension and this it's it's great, great track. I have to remember to to download that at some point. Um Korean dog scene. <laughs> there you go. I'll write that down in my notes. Um and you get this ominous uh gong of this uh bell going off too when she gets the dog, you know, jumps on top of her and she's going to get mauled and it's just like bong like death knell kind of thing really well done really like that bond heads off to venice to a glass factory to check out a lead from the stuff that he found in the safe and he sees this blonde woman who's going to pop up later on uh it's this model uh, i think her name's like irene something or whatever um she's like uh, can i interest you in something and he goes i'm tempted to say yes immediately <laughs> he it's almost like a disease for him. He cannot help himself. <laughs> this is a... There's certain levels of the Bond franchise that I appreciate a whole lot. And I think uh, the more and more that we go through this series, the more and more that our listeners and you guys too are like, I see why Tony likes this series because it's like dumb puns. And the main character is an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I love how open you are about just like I enjoy people who are pieces of shit. <laughs> <laughs> like real pieces of shit in real life, awful. Go burn in hell. If you're a fictional character though, it's fucking great. You know? <laughs> I'll always root for the bad guy in like uh some certain different situations. And this actress, by the way, she's also, uh, she eventually became a musician and she did a song called Happy Birthday, Mr. Bond for the 50th anniversary, which is just kind of like, all right. Uh, there's also this tour guide, this other blonde woman. She's showing off these uh, absolutely priceless million dollar type dishes and things. Uh, museum girl is going to pop up later too. And there's another woman there, 
Holly Goodhead. Bond's just like, Dr. Goodhead? As if he didn't already spot her. And he also he also has a line that uh, he likes to keep abreast of things. <laughs> just because, <Yeah. laughs> you know. <laughs> Imagine, like, a, a less charming version of this where you've got a character who's, like, a, an agent and he's supposed to be on this mission and he just kind of goes, like, nips are showing. <laughs> you know, kind of like... <laughs> he asks her to dinner. She says she's busy. He asks, well, can you think of a reason why we couldn't have a drink afterward? <laughs> she says, not immediately, but I'm sure I shall. I like that little exchange. It's like, Yeah, she seems like she's... You know, smarter than his bullshit, which is nice. Yeah, she's not willing to take it. And thankfully, unlike Anya, they don't just push her off to the side in this movie and just go like, well, you set yourself up as being great, but by the end of the movie, you're a damsel in distress again. I really like uh, Holly Goodhead. Well, we're entering the 80s, so one would hope that by now they figured out some things. See, I kind of disagree with that to an extent. I think that a part there is a part of the movie where Holly Goodhead is basically ignored entirely, and also the fact that they, do, even though she's not on downs with distress by the end of the movie, she is in the middle of the movie. So. There is a yeah, there's a bad section of that with the, the cable car, for instance. Yeah, so so I don't think it's completely removed from what Anya's experience was. I just think it's positioned differently. Insert joke about different positions. Uh, <laughs> Ew. <laughs> Let's talk about the gondola sequence. Bond's on, the, yeah, it's Venice, you know, there's gondolas and everything. Bond's on one. Uh, and another gondola pops up beside him with a casket, which opens up. And this guy in like mm-hmm. vampire mode springs up, takes a knife and chucks it at the gondolier and kills him. <laughs> Were you guys expecting this to happen? <laughs> No. I mean, when I saw the boat come across, I knew something was going to happen. I didn't think it was going to be a guy coming out of the coffin <laughs> with, a, with yeah. throwing knives, but someone was going to kill someone with it. I The first time I remember watching that, I'm thinking, how did they set this up? Like, who in their right mind does this shit? Where like they're like, you know, I think you really got to kill this Bond guy. How about we make this spring-loaded vampire knife trap in a gondola in case he pops up there. To be fair, Drax does um, address that later on in the movie. He does have the line, uh, you, you, what is it, like you, you keep 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 thwarting my efforts to make an amusable, uh, amusing death for you or something? Yeah, yeah, essentially so. (laughs) Essentially, he's just thinking of stuff in Tommy's head, like maybe he's got like a, a notepad of ideas that he's just jotting down and says like, how about this? Yeah, his list, his Rolodex of like options to do that. Well, we'll get to his Rolodex later on because he's got a Rolodex. But you're, but you're like saying like, who the fuck thinks of this? Who the fuck thinks of sequences like this entire part of the movie? Because so he's got on this um, so he's on this gondola just going around on a steady pace, and then he uh gets deals with the guy who's throwing the knife at him, and he throws the knife back at him. Then it turns out the gondola is also motor powered. Yeah, it's gonna be turned into a speedboat. He sets off fire, he's flying after people, like other speedboats behind him, shooting at him and stuff like that. They do the, the comic release spot that they were always doing during a boat chase where one, another gondola gets split in half. Because mm-hmm. ha ha ha. He, um, uh, bon- oh, Roger Moore, by the way, dubbed this whole thing on the set the Bondola. <laughs> That's good. That's fine. Like... Are you Roger Moore, Tony? <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit of Roger Moore. <laughs> but. But then there's the thing that really gets me is that what's Bond's escape mechanism of this entire sequence? Oh, it turns out the gondola can go on land as well because it's a hovercraft as well as a, a yeah. motorized gondola. And then this is oh, one. Wait. There's two, oh, wait. If you're talking about the reaction shot, is that I'm, what you're going to get to? About one, I'm talking about one particular reaction okay, shot. Okay, hold on. We're going we're gonna to get to that. We're going to get to that. <laughs> no, you can get to that because that is one of two things that make this movie absolute shit in certain areas. <laughs> For my money, th- this is more entertaining than the uh, um, the submarine bit in The Spy Who Loved Me. It's very, very similar because it's 
you know, it's a boat chase that involves turning into a different type of thing. Because uh, in you know, last movie, it's a car that turns into a boat that then drives up on the beach. And this one, of course, it's a, a, a gondola that turns into a bondola that turns into a hovercraft and comes out mm-hmm. onto the water and whatever. Uh, but they, he goes into the crowd. He's driving around, just driving around Venice. And the exact same guy from the last movie looks at his wine again. <laughs> Like the, what the fuck am I drinking? I'm looking at this thing. He apparently pops up at the next film too. For Your Eyes Only is one of the ones that I, I've seen the very least. So I forgot about that until I was um, doing a little bit of pre-research for For Your Eyes Only. So oh, is, that, is that the reaction spot you were talking about? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. There is one. <laughs> okay, we'll get. <laughs> There's several reaction shots in this one. Because the last one, we get the... Um, the people on the uh, beach, on the beach yeah, that are all like, yeah. "What's going on?" And we get the guy looking at his wine. And this one, they're like, "Let's do like eight of them." So mm-hmm. he crashes through a painter's canvas. We get a suspicious dog, but we also yeah, I, uh, get the uh, double take pigeon. Yes, that is. <laughs> that that, that is quality, Phil. No, no, I don't believe. They got someone to task it. It says, how can we make a pigeon double take? You know how they did it? Well, I know how they did it. They just reversed the footage backwards and forwards a little bit. No, not even that. That's not even the worst part. They fucking glued a pigeon to a board. No. (laughs) They glued a pigeon so that they can make sure that they could get the shot. They glued a pigeon. Uh, That's fucking terrible. And that was the best thing that they could do. (laughs) <laughs> so somewhere That's out there awful. somebody is responsible for working on the next James Bond film and they're like I'm orchestrating this parachute stunt and another person's like I'm working on you know the theme Moonraker and another person's like oh I've got this uh this gondola sequence I'm working on where I'm going to have to take this this gondola and I'm going to make it a hovercraft and it's it's going to be great he's going to go up on the land and everything and drive it around like it's a car and somebody else is like, did you tell Phil he's on pigeon board duty? <laughs> like, just, did he glue one of the pigeons yet? Jesus Christ. That's fucking terrible, Tony. So I'm, I'm they glad, take I'm a pigeon, was, they was glue it to a board so that they can do a shot that they reverse for a fucking double take pigeon. <sighs> I wonder if Moore was happy about that one as well. Uh, he probably had no <laughs> idea that, that was going on. It's so. Yeah, it probably while he, well, was he like, probably yeah. He just sat there, watched the movie. And went, why did we make that pigeon do a double take? Like, uh, <laughs> it is easily one of the absolute worst shots in the entire series, mm. and cool. I fucking love it because <laughs> it's like. Well, now that you told me the backstory, I don't love it. Like, I don't love how they did it. I hate the fact that it happens in the movie. It's stupid. It's dumb. It makes no sense. It'd be better without it. But it's so dumb and awful that I have this like reverence for it of just like how shitty is this <laughs> like, it's like it's, obviously we noticed this mostly about the more side of it but at least like there has to be one section throughout each of the movies where something just completely descends into total farce mm-hmm. like this is just a yeah this is just like um I don't know uh Lauren Hardy or um, free Stooges or anything along those lines. It's just, it's just, we need to do that at some stage of every movie. It doesn't matter okay. how serious the thing is or how serious the incident beforehand was. It just has to descend into total comedy for a couple of minutes. We're going to get one that I really, really hate in Octopussy, where, like, honestly, in the grand scheme of things, I'm like, I like the double take pigeon more than the one that's in Octopussy. It's on par with, like, the slide whistle. For the uh, the car sequence in Man with the Golden Gun, like every one of these movies has it. You got the slide whistle, you got the double take pigeon. You know, it's just kind of like. Eventually, we'll get to the. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> it's always that one shot where they just go too far. Yeah, Moore seems to be the master of going too far because there's like, this series was believable at one point and i was just like no no it's just this fictional character who can do whatever he wants because he's fictional 
I mean, a couple movies ago, we're getting things like in Dr. No, where he's like, okay, somebody's following me. Let me stop the car and the guy's going to bite into his cyanide cigarette. And we're just going to be like, damn, all right, the trail went cold and whatever. In this one, it's just like. Double take a pigeon, and I'm running on the streets, and it's like, what the? Is this? Is this jingle all the way? Like kind of thing. Like, so anyway, Bond goes to check out this laboratory where the keypad to get in plays the notes from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Bum 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 bum. We're just banging it on the head. Yeah, just remember everybody that Star Wars. You know, that kind of thing. A <laughs> little bit of trivia about that. Cubby Broccoli got permission from Spielberg, of course, to have the little song in there. And later on, Spielberg asked for a favor in return to use the Bond theme in the Goonies. And Broccoli joked with him. He's like, you know, there's five more notes in the Bond theme. <laughs> like, you're not, you're getting a better deal with this one kind of thing. <laughs> and Spielberg for a little bit had to be like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, yeah. <laughs> He's just like, no, I'm fucking with you, you know? Kind of thing. What a dick. <laughs> like, imagine that being true about him being like, mm, sorry, Steve. We got done. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so inside the lab, they're creating this nerve gas, which spills and kills the scientists, but not the rats in the room. So that's foreshadowing about that. Kind of like that. And uh, when Bond's leaving, he gets attacked by Chang wielding a kendo stick. Hell yeah. If you dig kendo sticks, check out smartoutmoment.com <laughs> for yeah. the pro wrestling stuff because kendo sticks are all over the place there and show some love to uh, Smart Out Moments YouTube channel and, and everything. And they destroy everything in the priceless glass museum. <laughs> I don't think that there's a That's single thing that doesn't get. Yeah, it's great. I love it. It's just like, it's so obvious that they're just trying to push each other into places where you're just going to break everything. <laughs> It's like, oh, just kick you over, or you fall over and knock over all of these these priceless glass ornaments and stuff like that. It's just, yeah, they have no respect for other people's property. I like the bit where uh, Bond picks up the thing that has the alarm and he puts it back, and then Chang immediately smashes it (laughs) with the the armor. Instead, it's just kind of like that typical like you try to save the vase and you try to save the vase, and then eventually you save it, and then a gunshot comes and hits it or something that kind of deal. Where you're like, God damn it. At the time, this was the record for the most sugar glass uh, stunt material smashed in a single scene. Just because they were like, smash it all, you know? And uh, this was a reworking of a scene that they originally had for the last film. They would have had this whole thing with the, mu- the, the mummy room in the Cairo Museum of Antiquities that they eventually cut and reworked it into this one because Moonraker is just a redoing of The Spy Who Loved Me. They just like copy and paste and Change a couple elements here and there. It's like an episode of Monday Night Raw. Again, smart on moment. And uh, Bond notices that some shipping crates are going to Rio de Janeiro. And we get this Pagliacci uh, musical performance down below. Some nice uh, Vesti La Juba. Absolutely love that song. One of my favorite operatic pieces. Well, maybe Consonetta Solaria. I might like that better. That's in Godfather 3. Not to keep mentioning other movies. <laughs> That's sort of the, speaking of the, mentioning other movies, Bond says, uh, play it again, Sam. That one of the great. One of the most often misquoted film lines in history. Uh, the line in Casablanca is, play it once, Sam. For old time's sake, play it, Sam. Play as time goes by. And everybody just says, play it again, Sam. Because nobody wants to repeat that. It's kind of like the whole, Luke, I am your father. He never says, Luke, I am your father. It's... Nope. No, I am your father. I am your father. And he goes, that's not true. That's impossible. <laughs> and, uh, As it turns out, it wasn't. Then he's like, nah, it is. No. <laughs> and he goes, I can, I'll one up you with that no and go, no, in another movie. Uh, <laughs> talking about other movies here instead. <laughs> Uh, anyway, how, uh, how good does, uh, Holly Goodhead look in her white gown, huh? (laughs) Yeah. Beautiful woman. She's up there in terms of just looks for the Bond girls. 
So we uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, as the series went on, I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to do uh, more of a tracking of this. Obviously, the Bond girls, they've got their characters and they've got the attractiveness and all that stuff, too. But some of the Bond girls, the idea behind them is just look at the pretty girl. So we're going to split the difference and talk about when we rank the Bond girls, we're going to rank them both on pure attractiveness just for our personal tastes and then about the characters and everything as a whole. I'll say this. Uh, I am... I'm not sure where I'm going to put Holly and some of the other characters here uh, as far as character wise, but at least right now, because I had done the same thing before I, uh, I mentioned before in other episodes, I did a ranking of this before we watched these movies back again. And just by my memory of, oh, I've seen Moonraker probably about eight times or so and whatever. Um, I don't know where she ranked originally. I'm going to have to, double check that but right now from just the ones that are in this she's my number five i got domino fiona plenty and then it's it's between her and anya i think that lois childs is very beautiful see i'm thinking she's gonna be number two she's gonna be right under domino right now like she's great looking what about you Callum? where does uh lois childs go I genuinely don't know. To me, to, honestly, and this may sound hot, she just looks like everyone else. Fair enough. That's fair. Yeah. And so, I've kind of got to the point now, especially this movie, and I just think, well, they're all just good looking people. And it's just like, I don't, I, I mean, I'll, if I'll go back and look over, I could probably see subtle differences and stuff like that, but it just feels like a bunch of very interchangeable women in terms of looks. And that's not a bad thing. It says like they're all really good looking. So I don't, I'm not trying to diminish it like that. But it's just like, okay, we've looked at a headshot. She's hot. She's in that type of thing. Yeah, and I she. Um, you can't go wrong with like, if you're looking for just a beautiful woman, and you go with somebody who's a beautiful woman like that, like she, she fits the bill. Beautiful well, I, woman. I, 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 prob- I mean, honestly, I'd probably put her middle of the road somewhere. I could probably name off the top of my head ten people that are. But I think are more attractive than she is. Fair enough. So, um, yeah, I'd go Tracy, Fiona, Domino, um, Anya, Solitaire, um, Anders, Mary Goodnight, Tiffany. Yeah, I could probably like Honey Rider. I'd go Ruby over her. I'd go Sylvia over her. She's like she's definitely not bad looking by any stretch of imagination, but it's just a case of she's a bit. I don't. Again, I don't want to diminish her or any sense like that. She's just like she doesn't. She wouldn't stand out in a crowd if it was just these bunch of women there for me. I could see that being the case. She's uh, she's high up on my list. Um, if I look under my uh, my previous ranking, because we haven't gotten to a lot of these, so it's not going to be like uh, yeah. you know, it, she's not going to stay where she was originally. But of course, she might change here and there. Just on that uh, before. It doesn't matter because the character is good. Yeah. It's just like there there are certain people that are just in the Bond movies just to look hot. She, um... So it's like Cider doesn't have any character, but she's there to look hot and she's a belly dancer. So like that's kind of... It's a a different thing. There's certain people that are just there for the looks. Yeah, there's some people on my previous list that are very high up on the looks and very low on the character. <laughs> like, Dr. Christmas Jones, we'll get to that. But on my previous list, just to give an indication when we get around to it, I had her on pure attractiveness at number 21. And I had her actually lower than Tiffany Case and Honey Ryder and Andre Anders and stuff. And this time around, I was like, you know what? I'm bumping her above her. I'm bumping her above uh, Kareem DeFour. I had Kareem DeFour at number 15 for instance. And uh, Kareen, I've got on uh, number 12 at this point. So she's going down, actually. And um, Goodhead's going up. And uh, yeah, obviously that's just purely based off of um, personal preferences about attractiveness and stuff. And different story when it comes to the character. I do have uh, I do have her pretty high up on there. I'm going to have to uh, adjust that while we're going along here. But um Beautiful, beautiful woman. And uh, when they've got the whole shot of her 
and the um like the hotel room and whatever that's just like a an image that i'm like oh wow like she really is really pretty uh bonds in her hotel room though and he starts fiddling with her stuff they're all secret gadgets there's a poison pen there's a diary that shoots a dart they, they really look the darts around this time frame there's a perfume bottle that's actually a flamethrower <laughs> a purse that's a transmitter device uh, and bond also notices the champagne and he has a line that's great <laughs> where he says bollinger if it's 69, you were expecting me. <laughs> so I didn't get that until right now. Really? It went over your head? And no, I just thought he was being a little snooty bitch about the about the uh, champagne. I would like the whole, like, uh, you know, if he drinks uh, Bollinger 50-whatever, then he can't be yeah, that bad. Like, like, you, you, know, you don't drink this warm it's got to be chilled and and you just did that and now i get it <laughs> very good <laughs> if it's 69 you were expecting me <laughs> oh it's so bad uh children we're just kids um so she's a cia agent they smooch Kind of a power play thing going on. They don't really trust each other. You know, should we work together? Eh, not trust each other. Whatever. We'll sleep together and that kind of thing. Will I they, like won't that. they? They certainly will. You know? Okay. Uh, uh, all right. Need to cut it a little bit here. He's just spent the entire movie insulting her. Yeah, she, there's no and reason for her to like him. And she's, da- and she's down with it immediately. Yeah. Like, fuck off. <laughs> there's absolutely no reason that she should like him except for well he's an agent he knows I'm an agent let me try to win him over and I don't really trust him and try to do something with that yeah, kind of like uh, I, I, I could I guess but just because like with, with the stuff with Anya he did he was diminishing towards Anya in the previous movie as well but it's just case like that one it came across a bit more playful like the part where she's starting the car and stuff like that and he's just making fun i feel like he'd just be making fun of anybody in that situation like if anybody was having trouble with getting the car going whether it's male female whatever it would just be him just making jokes of the whole situation with this one it's like early on in the movie he basically diminished her role as an intelligent woman by basically saying that she can't possibly be doing the job that she's supposed to be doing mm-hmm. and then has basically followed her along and stuff like that and it's been very forward of her and she's shown no signs of reciprocating up until this point and then, and then, yeah, just how to fuck because it's a bomb movie. Damn right. I would have liked <laughs> it to have stalled a little bit. Put the brakes on. Oh, well, uh, how deep into this movie was it? It was pretty deep in. They stalled long enough. It's like they fucked it as soon as they met, which is sometimes typical for Bond. I'm I thinking think of how, wait... how deep is your love? <laughs> I think if they'd waited until after the cable car scene, then I'm a bit more on board with it. But I think here was, I mean, here, like you say, if it's the two agents just doing stuff because that's what that typical what agents are supposed to do, because I assume that secret, like, people from MI6 and the CIA basically just fuck anybody they walk, that see, they see moving towards them in any direction. <laughs> that's like, that's like the vibe we get from this movie, right? It's just like, if you're a secret that's agent, you have to, you have to just fuck anybody. Mm-hmm. Like anything with a pulse. Either fuck or kill anything with a pulse, essentially, is the two motives. Sometimes for both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Hopefully so, not in uh, the reverse order. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's basically. So that I think that's the only reason for it. And if that's the case, then it's fine. But it's still, I, I just don't think that it's worthwhile. It's also just one of those manufactured things of like, well, they've already slept with each other. Now we can kind of brush along the romance easier. And yeah, exactly. it's not it's not well done when it comes to that. Yeah, no. Um, it's never. There's at least a moment where Bond leaves thinking that she's asleep. And she's awake, and then she's like, "Yeah, pack my bags because I got like a mission I'm gonna go to, and like, uh, he'll fuck off and whatever, and I'm gonna actually get the job done, sort of thing." But it, they don't hit it as hard as they should. And Bond meets up with M and the Defense Minister. Uh, like I mentioned, we, we're gonna be seeing Sir Frederick Gray quite a bit over the next couple of movies. He says, "I hope you know what you're doing, Bond. I play bridge with Drax." <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Now, well, clearly, nothing is more important than a game of bridge. That's just very stupid. Now, surprisingly, M is very supportive of Bond here. He says Bond doesn't normally hit the panic button unless there's a reason. He goes along with this idea, like when Bond goes to show them the laboratory and um, he gets them to put on these gas masks and surprise, the laboratory has gone. It's completely replaced with this lavish set and Drax is just standing there. No traces to the laboratory. He says the line I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, Frederick Gray, what a surprise and in distinguished company all wearing gas masks. You must excuse me, gentlemen, I'm not being English. I sometimes find your humor, sense of humor rather difficult to follow. <laughs> And Gray's just like, uh, uh, on behalf of the British government, I'm sorry. <laughs> kind of. Uh, he's pissed. You know, like uh, Callum said, he's basically filling the M role here of being like, you know, I, I, I've i never been that, this embarrassed in my entire life. I'm absolutely humiliated and everything. Uh, you owe us an, ex, uh, an explanation about this. And uh, we've gone from M flat out saying that he wishes Bond had a hit out on him. To saying, oh, you know what? Like, uh, there actually is that. Maybe you should take a two-week leave of absence. And, hey, but just don't slip up, you know? Because then we're both going to be in trouble. He's so much nicer. <laughs> yeah, well, they have know. this... They've invented this lightning rod of Richard, of um, Frederick Gray to be, like, he's the one who's on the outside. And he's, like, he represents the government, but he's not working with Bond and M. He's... Essentially, they're bosses. Yeah, I guess that's true. And so he's like, oh, he's the one that says, I don't know why you trust this guy, because he doesn't work with him, and he just feels that he's a bit of a, a loose cannon, whereas M knows that he gets results. Mm -hmm. And M's going to back his guy over this pencil-pushing bureaucrat, essentially. It works so much better. And it's a change from even the last movie, because the last movie, he's like, hey, Freddy, like, they're chums. And now Fred uh, just sort of like, you know, fuck this guy then, you know? And sadly, this is the last time we'll see Bernard Lee as M. He oh, died no. during the pre-production of the next film. We don't get M in the next movie at all. Uh, that's a shame. Because uh, yeah. they were just like, fuck, okay, he was supposed to be M. And so they temporarily replace him in the next film with the character of Bill Tanner. And then they eventually recast M, and yeah, we get M going forward. But yeah, the last uh, Bernard Lee one. Great M. My second favorite M, by far. If not my favorite, kind of depends. Certain days. Yeah, I'd really gotten used to the character. I thought we, we would have a bit more time with him. Uh, Drax uh, calls up someone, talking about how he needs a replacement for Chong. And he says, well, if you can get him, of course. And who is him? That's Jaws, baby. Jaws goes through a metal detector at an airport and just flashes his teeth. And the guy's just like, yep, you can go. Here's my question. Who the fuck does Drax call? Is this like henchmen or us? <laughs> yes. The henchmen or us. He calls up somebody just going, I need a new henchman. Oh, well, if you can yeah. get the guy that I've heard about named Jaws, that'd be great. This is like uh, when you call up like customer support and you're like, hey, I didn't get my package on time. And they're like, oh, it's OK. We'll give you a coupon and the package should arrive tomorrow. And you go, oh, thank you for like whatever. Like <laughs> hey, Chang's dead. Can can you give me a new one? <laughs> oh, Jaws. OK, well, I'll send over my uh, I'll wire the money immediately. Like, who's he calling? Like, assume he has some sort of broker or inf like information broker or something like that that has links to a bunch of hit like hi hired help and stuff like that. Essentially, essentially, like oh, I can get, I have, I know that this person's available or doesn't have a contract at the moment, so I can get him to work for you instead. Because there's got to be a crossover. This is one of the few times where the series actually has full blown continuity. Like this is a follow up 100 percent to the Spy Who Loved Me. Instead of being like, say, Diamonds Are Forever ignores a lot of things going forward. And Live and Let Die 
doesn't really acknowledge anything. And The Spy Who Loved Me acknowledges that Bond used to have a wife, but maybe things didn't go down the same way. Maybe we're in a slightly different universe, that kind of a thing. This is definitely a follow-up. So that means Carl Stromberg and Drax both at some point interacted with like this talent recruit agency that Jaws is a part of <laughs> that just ships out a henchman for hire kind of thing. Henchman for hire. Maybe that's the name of the service. I always thought uh, that was weird. Nobody seems to be working at Spectre right now. Maybe it's all those people who've just created a henchman service. (laughs) They lost their jobs after uh, Diamonds Are Forever didn't pan out. (laughs) They couldn't figure out a way to get the diamonds down and now they're out of money. So they're all just freelance. You got to call up uh, Jaws from the the temp agency. why they're working with uh, the guy behind Moonraker. (laughs) Yeah. Got to get those diamonds down. Oh, no, he's got his, uh, his dream of gold. That's right, that's true. Yeah, his search for gold. <laughs> that's that's what a Moonraker does. So we're off to Brazil. Shout out to my fiance if you're listening. Love you. And uh, Bond's being tailed by a pretty girl who takes a photo of him. Last time we saw a girl who looks almost exactly like her and took a Bond uh, photo was in Dr. No. No actual like trivia or anything. It's just a little observation. I, don't know. I just thought that they looked very similar, and it's interesting. Um. Anyway, uh, she's in the hotel room when Bond gets there, and she's preparing a drink for Bond. She already knows that he takes his vodka martinis shaken, not stirred. Her name is Manuela. She works for Station VH. She's another agent too, and Bond's already going to bang her. It's a uh, twenty seconds into meeting her, and he's like. So how do you kill five hours in Rio if you don't Samba while addressing her? <laughs> just really? Skip to the chase. Just like, oh, you're an agent too. Fuck. <laughs> really? He, he didn't give her the response of a woman. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I work for Station VH. A woman. <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, it's Carnival. Uh, that made Caroline don't be sad. Uh, pop. When uh, we were watching this, this is uh, this is the first Bond movie that she and I watched together. Um, she had seen some of the movies here and there. Of course, I've watched them all a million fucking times. But um, during quarantine, I was just kind of like one day, I'm like, you know, I really want to watch a Bond movie. And she's like, eh, which one do you want to watch? I'll watch it with you, you whatever. Moonraker? And I was like, for some reason, I want to watch Moonraker. I don't know why. I, I just wanted to watch Moonraker. And she's like, oh, okay, cool. I don't think I've seen that one. So when she's just like, what's up with the pigeon and like all that kind of stuff, it was fantastic to watch it with her. I wish I could have like recorded some of this because then eventually when we get to Brazil, she's all like, yay, Brazil. I'm like, you're adorable. Uh, Anyway, enough gushing about my future wife. Uh, (laughs) In the alley, there's this ominous thing with Jaws and the giant clown outfit. It's pretty frightening to see that coming your way down a narrow alley, right? I would say so. Not even knowing that it's Jaws, I'd just be like, I don't fucking like this. <laughs> I'm going to go. <laughs> Clowns like that. Just weird. And Jaws picks up Manuela like she's a fucking toddler, practically. Maybe this weird little dance with the crowd and all. It's very silly. I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, Bond jumps down. He shoots Jaws a big grin. Uh, the I cra- thought that was funny. Yeah. It's just a little, hey, you're, the, you're the teeth guy. Yeah. I have teeth. Fuck you. You know, like. <laughs> I don't like that the crowd takes Jaws away. And even worse, that like Bond and Manuela are just sort of like, well, just turn our backs to him and just casually walk and joke. It's like he could very easily just push these guys away and just go kill you. Well, he very stupidly did not. He just went with the flow. (laughs) Yeah, Jaws is a joke in this movie. Yeah. He's a a running gag more than a a violent, uh, powerful henchman. Yeah, he, big guy. he lost his uh, he was a heel in the last one he's a tweener in this one and then eventually a baby face and uh, he just becomes a joke also no more Manuela for the rest of the film <laughs> oh she served her purpose yeah yeah, yeah she's just there to do that particular job I don't, I'm not too mad about it I'm happy that she survived it just be it just feel like a really pointless death in another movie she would have been a sacrificial lamb for sure yeah, exactly. she would have gotten killed by Jaws and then so there might even be like, like a version of the script where she gets killed by Jaws because that would make sense. But then again, they didn't want to make Jaws be a killer because he turns good at the end. So, mm. you know, if they would have not made Jaws a killer, if this would have been a different 
henchmen than Jaws, guaranteed Manuel is dead. And there's this goofy little bit where Bond is looking through a telescope at this airfield and he and Holly lock sight paths. Very convenient. And they get on a cable car. Jaws bites the cord. It's another thing made out of licorice. We get one of the worst lines in this movie, at least delivery wise, one of the worst in the series. Hang on, James. And he's like, the thought had occurred to me. Uh, I don't, I hate that. Yeah, what? such a dumb line. Not but only is it a bad line, it, it's how she says it too. Just hang on, James. Come on, well, Lois. I had occurred to him. Uh, he says, she's like, a, you know him or whatever? And he's like, his name's Jaws. He kills people. <laughs> like, I'm imagining a business card that says, Jaws, I kill people. <laughs> and barely talk. And we get that hokey jump. One of the worst uh, rear projection types of shots where Jaws gets from one cable car to the other. It, it does not look like he's about to jump whatsoever. And it's terrible. Mm. Also, yeah, yeah. Holly is terrible in this. Absolutely. Com- complete waste. Yeah, she's just there. She tries to get in a few either shots or tries to help out a little bit. She just gets slapped down constantly by Jaws. Bond does basically all the real work by having him stuffed into the cable car itself. Mm-hmm. And then... She swings a chain, and it, that's like it. Mm. Does nothing. And then Bond's the one who actually wanted her to bring the chain in the first place because he has yeah. all the good ideas. And uh, well, eventually, when they get Jaws into the cable car, he then has his unbelievable arm strength. Yeah. To to zip wire down a fucking cable, holding a chain in both hands with a woman attached around him. A woman. <laughs> yeah. so, well, it, just, it could be anybody, but it's just because like yeah. it's completely physically impossible to do this unless you're like. Have you ever really tried? Good. Well, maybe when I get to like, my 50s, maybe I'd just like to develop really super arm strength for whatever I can do. It's all that afternoon tea. Yeah, he's been, he, he he's been pressing those day. cucumber sandwiches really hard. Well, he refused them, those stuff, so clearly he's not using that power. <laughs> he's 69. Oh, oh, there you go. <laughs> this would have been a good moment for the Bond theme, I think. You know, going down the thing. Instead, it's just like this more dangerous kind of music and then purely comedic where Jaws crashes the cable car into the dude controlling it. And of course, Jaws is totally fine. We've seen this before a few times. He crashes through uh, the tent at the beginning of the movie, you know, falling from fucking space and uh, not quite space yet. Uh, he, he does later on though. Um, he fell from the, the car in the last movie, but here's the big kicker this time around. Uh, he's, you know, got this thing on top of him and he has to try to push it off. And this little blonde girl with a hell of a push up bra and, uh, glasses and pigtails comes to help him out. Now her name is not said in the movie, but her name's Dolly. We have to talk about her for quite a bit, oddly enough. And it's not just because of the Romeo and Juliet overture that plays with the whole da 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 da. But we do have to address that and a couple other things. When you're watching this, what are you thinking with this whole they immediately fall in love type of thing? Because this is absurd. You know, nice. It's like every other movie to me. Oh. Uh, yeah, you've seen many times where this happens. I didn't think anything of it. In a Bond movie, though, the, the, like the Looney Tunes type of thing, like that. Well, well that's well, that's what he is. That's what Jaws is in this. In this yeah, movie. I, I know that's like it's not it's not appropriate. That's why this movie, funny enough, Tony, that you described this one as better as Why Love Me. Turns out it's not better than the Spy Who Loved Me. <laughs> I would kind of agree with that. I think it's so much more fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, but it's dumb. You're just telling me this. You're just like explaining to this guy who was a vicious killer in the previous movie. Who thought, "Oh, this guy's so good. Let's bring him back for the second one." They just turn him into like Lurch from the Adams Family. Yeah. <laughs> Andre could have played Jaws in this movie. Oh yeah, he, like this feels like Andre's character from The Princess Bride. Yeah, that's why. That's kind of where I got it from, because he does kind of just turn into, "Hey, anybody want a peanut?" <laughs> 
at least as far as March 14th, when we're recording this, Princess Bride is still on the, if not the absolute top of the list of movies that I have never seen that I need to watch. Shut the fuck up. No. Yeah, I, don't, yeah, I can't believe that. I've never that watched is... uh, the full movie. I've seen a couple scenes All here right, and there. I guess five. Yeah. That's your cue. <laughs> <laughs> that that is that is for me that's top 10 movie of all time for me i i got that on the list i got karate kid on the list uh yeah i mentioned before like i it took me until quarantine basically to get around to um back to the future you know uh yeah, one of the ones I, that i just I, I i never wanted to watch it on tv and i never bothered to rent it back in the day and then over the years, I've just watched other movies and stuff. So it's, yeah, that's that's odd that with all of the technology that we have now, you're just like, nah, I'm not gonna watch it. Right. I I know there's such a reverence for the movie that I don't want to watch it until I'm in the mood to watch it because I don't want to watch it and dislike it. I want to like it. So maybe by the time you guys are listening to this, maybe I'll have watched it. I don't know. We got a couple weeks. But Dolly, we got to talk about this. This is, if you've heard, maybe you haven't heard of this, maybe you have. I'm pretty sure that you guys have. Maybe some of the, uh, the listeners have as well. Have you guys ever heard of the Mandela Effect? Or the Mandela Effect? Are you talking about the braces? Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but Mandela Effect for certain things is, is very fun. Unfortunately, I saw that before i saw the movie so it didn't happen with me but i know what you're talking about so do you know any of the backstory behind this whole thing callum with the andela effect and dolly no that's really like uh that's that's beyond my knowledge so for anybody who doesn't know here's a quick uh thing here the mandela effect is the, the phrase that people use for explaining the phenomenon of a mass group of people that all remember something being different than what it is, where it comes from one of the more famous examples of it is a ton of people, myself included, remember hearing about uh, Nelson Mandela dying in prison. And he didn't. And a huge amount of people are like, I fucking read that newspaper. I heard it on TV. He died in prison. And I full blown, I remember back in the day, I remember being a kid and hearing about rest in peace, Nelson Mandela. He passed away in prison. And it it's not true. And there's a lot of examples of this where Berenstein Bears is one of them where That's people are like, that- uh, yeah. Is it Berenstain? Is it Berenstain? It was Berenstain, and then somehow it became Berenstain. I don't know. Right. It's like a glitch in the matrix type of a thing. And Dolly in this movie is one of the textbook examples of this. And it, it apl- applies to me, too. I full-blown remember her having braces. That was the joke. Is... Jaws sees this girl and she smiles and she's got braces and he's got the metal teeth and that's why they fall in love immediately. And it makes perfect sense. She doesn't have braces. No, she doesn't. There's a post even going back to 1999 on the internet that, I mean, there's before that, you know, there's, there's a, some kind of records here and there, but I, I could trace at least back to 1999 of people going, uh, you know w- what the fuck's with the braces? <laughs> like this this Google group thing. It's uh, Maddie Lamfrey, where he says, "I watched Moonraker the other day, which was more comedy than anything else. I thought Jaws Jaws's girlfriend wore wore braces in uh, her teeth, hence the attraction. But this time, no braces. Am I misremembering? So this is like this isn't something that's brand new. The past couple years or something. This is decades, even from when the movie came out." When people are like, oh, yeah, you know, Dolly, uh, this girl, this uh, pigtailed uh, blonde girl with braces, whatever. Nope, no braces. There's a commercial for Sampo mini visa card where the whole gag is Jaws is uh, Richard Keel is in the thing. And he's like, oh, you know, do you take this visa card? And this woman, this cashier is like, you know, yeah, I do. Like, because it's the, the new visa card and whatever. And he's all intimidating, and then she smiles at him, and she's got braces on. 
Like people have built a whole thing on this idea of Dolly's got braces and she doesn't. It's so fucking weird because I'm like, I remember her having braces. So isn't uh, this you, movie then? Oh, that would work. No, I was just saying, now you're wrong because, you know, glitch in the Matrix. Yeah. Wasn't well, well, this movie then like a weird amalgamation of both um, essentially pushing both the Mandela effect in terms of this moment here where people just fed it and then also repeating a previous Mandela effect in saying the play it again, Sam which people assume is something that's said in the movie. Yeah. It actually isn't. Yeah. So it's it's both, fucking so it's weird. Both, so it's both saying a Mandela effect in the movie and then starting a Mandela effect. So it's both the origin and the yeah. demonstration of a Mandela effect. Hell. This movie, this is the movie that you played people in film school that want to know what the Mandela effect is. It's so weird. And it's just like, if you do a search for like, anything close to this like dolly moonraker or something like that it's like braces everybody's just like are you pro braces or anti braces like did she have them or did she not i am firmly in the dolly had braces camp that's so crazy and the more that stuff like that happens over time the more that i'm like am i nuts like <laughs> like well first of all yes <laughs> like like legit like crazy like one day i'm gonna snap and i'm gonna be like oh i've actually been i don't know uh dying of like heat exhaustion in the desert or something and all this stuff that i'm imagining is not real like i'm talking into a a microphone right now i'm talking into like a dead lizard that i picked up and i'm walking around the desert having a psychotropic fit or something like my neo <laughs> i don't know we have mentioned a lot of other movies in this. We really have, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Dolly, it's it's a thing. It is. Uh, Bond quip time. Holly asks if he's broken anything, and he says, "Only my tailor's heart." <laughs> <laughs> and there's a terrible thing where some goons knock him out with this smack to the head, which is just like Pah! terrible. They get strapped to these ambulance stretchers. There's this interesting little bit where Bond's like sliding down while the goons ogling Holly. And a lot of uh, product placement in this film. You've got Seven Up, you got British Airways. There's the action sequence is basically them passing by a bunch of billboards for product placement. Not a big fan of it. Yeah, Good I mean, for the brand. I mean, like, yeah, you're I can't the say new it me. It's it's obvious, but it doesn't exactly offend me. There's worse stuff, like a pigeon glued to a fucking board. <laughs> then we get another last movie. We got the Lawrence of Arabia thing. So in this one, you've got the uh, da 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 because Bond's on horseback, and you know you got to do that kind of a joke. And we get more office stuff. There's a quick bit with Money Penny who says Bond looks like he fell off a mountain. And he's just kind of like, you know, funny you say that uh, kind of thing. And he meets up with Q, immediately goes, balls, Q. <laughs> bolus, 007, uh, exploding bolus, to be precise. And it's time for our wacky gadget montage. You get a, a sleepy guy who's actually a machine gun turret. You know, a laser gun that's which people recognize from Goldeneye uh, video game. Obviously, decades after this movie came out, but uh, QLab has studied a vial of the nerve gas. He's determined that uh, it's part of the super rare plant. Bond knows where to go next. So he goes there and we get our second boat chase of the film. Not going on uh, too much on my taste to really like this one. I think that they could have cut it pretty much entirely. Especially because it's got that shitty, super happy 007 theme that I really hate. That bum 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 kind of one. Thankfully, it's the last time we hear it in the series. They never bring it back. I don't like it. I don't like the bow chase. I could have done without it. Well, just the opportunity to do another vehicle that has weapons attached to it, which we're not explained to. So he just drops mines, he fires torpedoes out of it. I mean, the only reason that boat chase is there is that he can escape the boat that he's supposed to keep safe, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> the boat's got to get destroyed out in a hang glider so jaws can fall off a waterfall. Another Wiley Coyote bit. 
Just you know, whoa, oh, falling off a waterfall. It's, it's funny because like he he goes for the steering wheel and he rips the steering wheel off because he's again he's an absolute class, and he just just falls down a waterfall. I, I, I would have loved it if they'd have done that. Um, I, I don't know what the name of the actual scream is, but it's that one that goes <laughs> that sort of thing as they go down. You're talking about that sounds like goofy to me. Yeah, like or even the goofy scream or whatever you you would call it that sort of thing. It's just like a lot of different. Um, just a really loud scream. It's not a Wilhelm scream, but something of that ilk. Yeah, I'm blanking on what it might be. I'm sure I've heard it a million times. Maybe a Jaws cartoon was in the works. You don't know. I mean, eventually he pops up at James Bond Jr., which I, I really kind of want to visit that because I, I don't remember a damn thing about it, but I know that Jaws is there. And I, I think that Odd Job is there and he's like a gangster rapper or something. It's, is, like, <laughs> it's, none of this shit makes any sense. That come out? Like 91 or something, I think. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. The Bond ends up at this uh, beautiful location. Uh, Maybe like the best location in the series for my taste. The waterfall looks great. It's got this cool looking temple. Happens to be a whole bunch of beautiful women there too. That's not bad. The museum tour guides there, for instance. Uh, I'm not as big on... um, The one, uh, the blonde one from earlier. The, you know, could I interest you? Whatever. yeah, you know, lower on the end of the pure hotness spectrum for me. Apparently, one of the girls is uh, the daughter of Lois Maxwell, the one who plays Money Penny. I don't know which one though. Uh, Melinda Maxwell. And Bond's like eyeing him up, and this this spring trap thing pushes him into the water where there's this giant snake. It's a anaconda or a boa constrictor, something. I don't know. I don't know my snakes. Uh, <laughs> snakes, snakes. I don't, kind of I don't know no snakes. <laughs> well, it's probably some kind of constrictor. It's not trying to bite bond. It's trying to suffocate you. Yeah, right. T- ten points if you get that reference too. By the way, um, later on he says uh, that um, the snake had a crush on him. So that's the thing. He kills sure. it. He kills it with the uh, the poison pen. So you know uh, the way that they did this, they got Ross Kananga. The alligator guy from the uh, Live and Let Die. He took this real snake. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, well, you had me go. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you had me until the real snake. It's clearly, it's a plastic snake when you see it yeah. <laughs> coming out of the water. Uh, it's at this point that if you've played the GoldenEye video game, you're like, oh shit, it's the Aztec level, which is cool. Time for a monologue. Drax stole the Moonraker back because one of his faulty uh, Moonrakers needed to be replaced. And he's going to take this super race of people into space and wipe out the planet with this gas and the flower and all. It's basically the same kind of thing as Stromberg's plot from the last movie, but it's the space angle instead of the under the sea angle. Again, they copy and pasted this movie for the most part. Mm Mm-hmm. It turns out that Goodhead's been captured too. And they're put into this room with this exhaust from the ship that's going to incinerate them, which is apparently one of the only things that's in the book in this movie. That's like one of the few things that they took from the book. And I think it's kind of cool. But you know, every single like of these rooms that has, that's supposed to, well, essentially the only purpose we know of this room is that it's completely underneath a a, a sh- shuttle that's about to launch. The one thing you absolutely need in that environment is an air vent. Yeah, somehow that makes sense, right? Conveniently, no, an doesn't. air vent. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. There's no yeah. reason for it to be there. The only reason you put it in there is because you want to have somebody give them even the slightest opportunity to escape. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It shouldn't even have air being able to go through that vent. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, the ship goes off, it incinerates them, and they die. That's the end of the film. There's no more James Bond will return in, you know, because it happens, and, you know, that's the... That's Moonraker. What'd you guys think of the film? Jeez, you <laughs> told me a weird bill of goods, because <laughs> I thought there was no time to die. Yeah. And then, then it looked, and also all the toys go into the incinerator at the end of Toy Story 3, and so there was never, what <laughs> never a fourth movie. Don't get me started on Toy Story 4. Yeah. <laughs> How many movies have we mentioned in this one? <laughs> we got uh, Toy Story. We got 
uh, Godfather 3, uh, Star Wars Matrix. <laughs> we need to make it somewhat interesting because we're just talking about um, From Russia, with, not From Russia, we're talking about the um, That's why you love me again. <laughs> so, of course, Bonds escapes. He, he uses his explosive Seco brand watch. Make sure you go buy one of those today, essentially. And uh, uses that to take them out with the air vent. And of course, he takes an extra second to say bang on time instead of just you know, going through the air vent. Not his best line. And then the note that I've got written down, a different thing that just says, Bond in space. <laughs> they stow away and get on a ship. Bond in space, baby. We're getting in that direction. And here is where I will, uh, I will send you guys a link to a song. I'm going to send this to you guys on our Skype chat right here. That I want you to uh, play it. I got it set up at a specific point in this. The song is called Flight Into Space. So a minute and 42 seconds into this particular YouTube video that I'm sending uh, for anybody else that's in there. Um, it's like around a minute and 42 in the song. This is one of my favorite pieces of film uh, of uh, music from the entire film series. Uh the part that I really love, the minute 42 in it, is this choir that I think is just this beautiful, beautiful piece. Uh, they're going into space, and instead of being like an action-y theme or something, it's got this um, kind of like the wonders of the world kind of feel to it or whatever. I, I I absolutely love it. One of my absolute favorite pieces of music from the series. I know you guys don't pay too much attention to the music going on, but since you guys are playing this uh, in the background, what are you thinking about it? It's beautiful. Like it's very calming. This will end up on a playlist of mine. Yeah, it's nice. I cannot say I paid any attention to it in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> he did. So unless you unless feel... you showed it to me, I would have no idea what it was. I, I forgot what we were nothing. doing on Friday or on, you know, Friday when we were doing the hot tags, but you played something else and I was like, oh man, since I'm focusing on the music, it is really good. Was that the uh, thing from Man with the Golden Gun? Or no, uh, Vitable Kill? I think. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, because there's, there's a really good action theme in Octopussy and a really good action theme in a Vitable Kill that I really like too. Um, I don't know where this ranks on the uh, flight in the space. I don't know where it ranks as far as like pure, just outside of the main themes, but I'm writing these down as I'm going along about like, I really like the music in the Korean scene in the, with the dogs. I love the flight in the space thing. Like if they were to do like an orchestra plays bond music type of thing, I would love for them to do that kind of a thing. It's great. Absolutely great. Honestly, I think that the special effects are pretty decent too for the time. There's like some composite shots that are off where you could see like just the black uh, behind it and it doesn't have any stars exactly where it's moving. But some that work pretty well. They got the zero gravity stuff going on with the floating pen and all. I think that's it's not that bad for the time. No, I don't think it. Yeah, I don't find anything like egregious with it whatsoever. It's just obviously the concept time. is egregious. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course the concept is egregious, but I don't find anything like, negative about it. It's fine. It's it's what you'd expect a space movie to look like in that in that time. Space. There's a, <laughs> it's a space. It's, it's Bonds now. He's in space. He owns it. <laughs> He he's, it. he's about to seize the space station. He uh, is going to fight that rocket. You know, it's just uh, it's Mondays. They're hell. Uh, he notices that there's this whole Nova's Ark plan. Uh, they end up at this big space station that's not showing up on radar, which is why nobody knows that it's there. That's a conundrum that they're going to solve later on. Uh, they also got the world record for the biggest amount of zero G wire stuff used in this scene i'm sure that's not what the guinness thing zero g wire stuff i don't know what the technical fucking term is uh drax gives us another another eloquent speech the cradle of the heavens they're they're all going to be gods and all this other kind of stuff this dude's really full of himself and uh 
Holly eventually gets a little bit of an action sequence by herself, largely of her own, where she takes out a couple guys. And I like that Bond doesn't really call that much attention to it. It might be like an apologist's point of view, but he sort of just lets her do her thing. Like, he knows that she's capable of handling herself. He doesn't go, oh, a woman fighting? You know, he doesn't come to the rescue. I think that that is how you do what we were complaining about when it came to Anya in the last film. Like, she actually gets to do something in the last sequences. And I like that a lot. Yeah. I I thought this was very good. And to be fair, you know, maybe specifically because we've harped on the whole a woman thing but maybe specifically in the 70s it was still like huh not what i was expecting but he is expecting her to at least know how to kick some ass because you know she's clearly well equipped he sees she has gadgets she is she should be able to handle herself to some degree does she win points uh for you calm on that i mean i appreciate the fact that she's the one that does some some fighting and takes some people out I do think that you're being apologetic. I think Bond does look like she, he's surprised that she did it. A little bit. I mean, it's not full so he, blown. He says that and says like, uh, "What did you learn how to? Did you learn that in, at NASA? That sort of line and stuff like that." It's just like, yeah, he clearly is bewildered about the fact that she managed to beat both people up. But he kind of sits back and just watches her instead of being like, "Oh, she's gonna fuck it up, and I gotta save yeah, her." Because yeah. oh, he's lucky mine. Like, he's like thinking, "What? <laughs> she's fighting them and she's beating them." <laughs> Oh, what? <laughs> stunned into, he's stunned into just watching. So they disable the radar jamming. The governments are like, the fuck? You know, and start talking to we, each other. And we see General Gogol again in his pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to have Major Amasova, you know, Bond girl of the last film, be the woman that's in bed with him. Which I'm glad that they didn't do. Yeah, that was weird. There was no hint of a sexual relationship between those two in the last movie, and that would have been strange for her to be sleeping with her boss. But that brings up another bit of trivia. Lois Childs, the one who plays Goodhead in this, was originally offered the part of Triple X in the last movie, but she retired from acting and turned it down. And then in the meantime, between The Spy Who Loved Me and this one, she decided she wanted to act again, and she only got the part because she ended up sitting next to the director of both the films on just a random flight. And it's just sort of like, oh, the girl that we wanted to have in the last one. Hey, we're doing another one. You want to do that? So, She's like, yeah, I, I, Triple X wasn't my thing, but Goodhead, I could do that. I think she's much better as Holly Goodhead. I can't picture her being Anya, especially not the other way around. Well, I mean, you don't know how good a Russian accent is either. So. Yeah, true. Uh, maybe she does. I've never seen Lois Childs in another movie, as far as I'm aware. Then again, I don't think I've seen uh, Barbara Bach in another movie either. <laughs> Most Bond girls I haven't seen in more than the movie that they're in. Like, uh, even uh, some of the more recent ones, like Berenice, uh, Merlot, and everything. There's, out of like a hundred Bond girls, there's maybe like ten that have been in more movies than just like the one that they are that I've seen. So... Maybe, maybe she's got this great Russian accent. I don't know. The Globes are launched. Launched. Uh, Jaws discovers the two of them. Bond punches him right in the teeth. And then there's this joke that maybe he's got metal junk. Because why yes. not? We'd have to ask Dolly. <laughs> she's like, uh, get stuck in my uh, braces. <laughs> and then it's like, it doesn't because you don't have braces. Bond brings up a good point. Uh, in this, he says, you know, if this is a super race, Jaws has no place there. And I really like that. But I mean, I mean, I, I kind of get that, but I also think you have this unkillable human and he's not a super race type thing. He's a freak, obviously, but he's a, clearly you want some sort of genetics with that. Yeah, but he's got fucked up teeth. <laughs> well, he doesn't have teeth. He has metal. He has he has metal where teeth are supposed to be. That's not part of his human anatomy. He's evolved beyond teeth. <laughs> Presumably yeah. he doesn't have teeth. Presumably he lost his teeth and replaced them with those metal jaws. Uh, what's to say? Uh, one of the people on the commentary track uh, 
I forget if it's like this part of the movie or later on, uh, he brings up a point. He's like, do you think he knows that uh, people call him Jaws? <laughs> it's like, yeah, he does. I mean, I'm pretty sure he's referred to as Jaws in the last movie. Like, Jaws, go whatever and do this kind of a thing. But like, it's kind of funny to think that like, I don't know, somebody just pinpoints a thing and just starts calling you that. Like, imagine somebody just being like, hey, ears or something. And you're like, ah, I got have big ears, that kind of thing. And you're like, yep, your ears from now on. I don't care if your name's Herb or whatever, <laughs> you know. Well, then what do you think Jaws' name is? I forget what it was in the, it was, horror was horror. the name of the thing, and it was something, I, I don't remember, it started with an H. Um, either way, it works for Jaws. He turns baby face. Again, smart out moment, everybody, for these terms. We get some more zero gravity stuff. Uh, they start this action sequence in space with these astronauts against Drax's people. It's all pew, 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 zap, 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 zap. Uh, do the Star Wars. Not a big fan. <laughs> no, I, di- I didn't like this whole shooting like sequence. Story. Yeah, it was just, it's just so bad as well. I mean, you can say what you want about the space, space station looking the way they did, and that's quite impressive, but the actual laser fighting in space, they're basically just standing still and you just see blue sparks go across the screen every now and again. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like one of the weak, it's one of the weakest looking things I've seen in the entire franchise. Uh, Saul Horowitz is just... Saul Horowitz, okay. The H for the Horowitz. Yeah, they could have done better with this. Because they have some shots where people are like floating th- through uh, space after they got shot that aren't that bad, but a lot of the close-up things are kind of like you only live twice where like the helicopter wasn't moving when it was exploding and stuff. Not done all that well. Bond and Drax end up in a corridor. The rest dark gun comes back into play. He nails him with that. It says that he's heartbroken and uh, tells him to take a giant step for mankind. I thought that was funny. <laughs> I like that quote a bit. Sends him out in the airlock in space and in typical Bond formula, the Bond girl has to show up immediately afterward and go, where's Drax? So that he can go, oh, he had to fly. So there's <laughs> three, just rapid fire. You're heartbroken. Take a giant step. He had to fly. It's just Quip City. In Space City. She's owned by Bond. I like the way that uh, that he dies here. I like that the gadget comes back. I like that he gets killed in an interesting type of way of being, you know, floating through space. It's not the best death in the series. Not the worst. But, yeah. You know, I mean, he doesn't turn into a balloon. So. Yeah, Kananga. Upon, like, as time goes, Kananga's death is real bad. Yeah. Pro or con on this uh, death scene, Callum? What are you thinking? I mean, it's, it's not particularly memorable. <laughs> Just... Okay, he's in space and he gets launched out of space. So, that's... Drax in space. <laughs> like you say, space. what about Kanga's one? Kanga's one is stupid, but, he's... but you're not going to get it. Yeah. This one is just, okay, they were in space and the main villain gets ejected out of space. I'm basically, not going to forget there's... that quip. But, uh... <laughs> Go ahead, but, take but, a sip of mankind. But I, but I basically just watched the fire sequence where I've seen 20 other people fly through space dead. It's just like, just does one of those. Oh, they weren't flying, they were standing still, remember? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, would have been, well, well, no, once they get shot and stuff like that, then we see them just, like, scattering all over the place and whatever. But, no, I would have... It would be more memorable if he went out in space and his head exploded. Because of the lack of oxygen. Damn, that's something. We're not going to quite get that later on. I imagine we will get it somewhat later on. We'll get something similar. I'll say that. Not in this movie, though. <laughs> So the way that they shot the space station exploding for the visual effects <laughs> it had to be a fun day on the set. They basically locked the set down, put up a camera, and shot the model with shotguns. <laughs> it's just like, hey, anybody want to be a part of that? Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Just like, <laughs> I'd imagine that was a fucking great day of just like, let's just blow up our fucking... Uh, model and just shoot it with a shotgun and just kind of be like, yeah, all right, woo, fun. Never shot a shotgun before in my life. Never shot a single regular gun in my life for that matter. But I'd love to have been there and to see them just being like, yeah, like, fuck you, space station <laughs> kind of a thing. They felt things weird in this movie. You know, glue a pigeon, shoot the model with a shotgun. Why not? 
Just do some weird shit. It's 1979. We're getting into the wacky 80s. You know, none of us have bonitis. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> Mission of movies, TV shows now. Mission accomplished mostly. There's still those three globes heading towards Earth. They're going to kill millions of people. So Bond and Holly get on a ship, Moonraker 5. And uh, they're stuck with the docking platforms release system. So they need a little bit of help from Jaws, old buddy. He pops a bottle of champagne with his mouth because that's cool and says his only line in the entire series. He toasts to Dolly and he says, Well, here's to us. He talked. <laughs> Good for him. Like, uh, yeah. Not a mute. I'm happy for him. So our job can just go, ah. But Jaws gets a line. And, uh. Well, he's the baby face now. Yeah. He's good guys, so he can talk. And he can also apparently live, because <laughs> we're meant to believe that Jaws and Dolly survive, because Bond casually is just like, don't worry, kid. Uh, don't worry, they'll make it. Uh, it's only 100 miles to Earth, and later on they get picked up and. Uh, NASA guys just like you know there's a blonde woman and a really tall guy kind of thing um, they live in the middle of nowhere yeah just one of those things uh, don't worry everybody the the good Jaws he's not gonna die he helps him out and we get, uh, Bond gets his Luke Skywalker in the trench of Death Star moment where he's you know shooting down the globes and stuff uh, this one actually matters though because when Bond destroys the globes the earth isn't screwed but when Luke destroys the Death Star, 30 years later, the Starkiller base comes out and clear, uh, blows the fuck out of everything anyway. And the Empire comes back and Palpatine comes back and the whole fucking series doesn't matter because the sequel trilogy sucks. And <laughs> How the hell did you manage to get that in there? Because <laughs> fuck... Literally, uh... literally, that was the first thing he wrote down before this entire movie. Yeah. Just, uh... Just fuck Star Wars. <laughs> No, no, basically the entire series up to this point is just leading to the point where he can say fuck Star Wars at the end of this. <laughs> it's like, okay, so I'm going to come up with this thing called Review to a Kill. It's going to be going through all the Bond series and stuff like that just so I can say fuck you Star Wars at some point. <laughs> well, if we ever do, uh, if I can figure out a pun to go back in time and talk about the Star Wars ones and go through these over and over, then when we get to A Force Awakens, I'll just, that'll be a trip. Uh, I've done the review uh, review point of The Force Awakens, and that's before things got worse, where I'm sitting there going, there's some things I don't like, but uh, there's some potential here. And by the time you get to Last Jedi, I'm just like, fuck, fuck, <laughs> kind of, you know. <laughs> so yay, the world is saved. You know, back on Earth, NASA and company are trying to reach Bond and Goodhead. The feed is, uh, this is such a you know monumental thing that the feed's going to go and get patched directly to the White House and Buckingham Palace. And they see Bond floating on top of Holly, naked, wrapped in a sheet. And the fucking line. <laughs> okay, this is the best line in the entire franchise. So. <laughs> one, one of the best lines, maybe in film history. <laughs> the defense minister says, my God, what's Bond doing? And Q, Q's the one who gets the line, because... I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fucking good. It's so good. Afterward, Holly says, take me around the world one more time. And it's like, who fucking cares about that? Re-entry line. That's... You got to admit, as goofy and fucking weird and wacky as this movie is, that line's just like, uh... Well, oh, chef's kiss. I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. God damn, they deserve a fucking raise for that. <laughs> that that is a pop. That's that's a raise. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I guess I am Roger Moore. Do you, think, do you think people have gone back over time, like the people that have written the future Bond movies and stuff like that, have gone back and check out that line and just gone, "Fuck, <laughs> just like, like we can't do it. We, we can't, can't beat that this line, <laughs> like this." Like, it almost feels like, okay, this is the magnum opus of Bond with the girl at the end of the movie. It's just like, you can't... That's probably, Maybe that's why more recent movies, Bond just doesn't end with the girl doing this stuff. Because they just know, well, there's no point. We can't come up with a line like that anymore. You're not tapping that. <laughs> I will give him credit. The world is not enough. Gives it a run for its money. It, yeah, it's... That's funny, because the... 
that's only because of what the girl's name is. Right, yeah. But then again, you know, you got Goodhead in this one. They didn't work that into there. Um, no. I, but this I is, know, this is just... better. Like, it's it's so fucking good, that I line. They work the name in there. Oh, well, well, I don't want to spoil it before the actual No, 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 no. I mean, like, how did they not work the Goodhead in there? Like, that's... It was right there. How did we not do that? What I'm surprised that she doesn't headbutt somebody and he just goes like, oh, living up to your name or something like, you know. That's not what I was mm-hmm. expecting when I heard you. What's not, what's not like anything lives up to it. It's not like Bond says, like, Bond says anything about pussy galore beyond just the first name. You just hear the name and that's the that's the joke. Well, no, he does say, <laughs> oh, you've got to be joking. Uh, I must be dreaming. Uh, but it, it would have been funny if later on in the movie he goes, oh, galore, you weren't kidding. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> like plenty of, I mean, there are plenty of talkies just like named after um, your father. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I love that. But I mean, well, the good head joke is woman. You're a woman. That's the joke. That's the joke about good head. I love the re-entry line. Like yeah. the keeping the British end up one is like I like that one, but this blows it out of the water. This is just like, oh man, uh, Oscar, give it an. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, whoever whoever wrote that line is like. I don't know who was the actual writer behind it, but I hope they, were they did a good, they did a good job there. And then we get a, a funky disco version of Moonraker, you know, boom, 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 kind of like the thing going on. Yeah, you got to say goodbye to the seventies somehow, Tony. Yeah, it's uh, it's very disco. Uh, you know, you're going to be skating around listening to uh, this Moonraker theme. And that's the end of the movie. Uh. <laughs> Callum, you were saying before you you were excited to get into the, the Roger Moore goofy thing. So, what are you thinking when you're digesting this? Well, this is absurd, as <laughs> you'd expect it to be at this point. But it's not like I'm I'm certainly not hating the Moore movies. The Moore movies are actually some of the most fun that I'm having in the, across this entire series, and it's a mixture due to the absurdity, but also due to the fact that just the stories are better. I just think that the characters feel more fleshed out. Bond feels like he's having, again, it's a it's a goofier, more light-hearted Bond, but it's not like he's still not killing people or he's still not like doing the aggressive stuff from time to time. It's just a bit more. I, I don't know. These movies feel like they're made for entertainment rather than some of the classical ones, which feel a bit more true to the source material. But the source material, uh, spoiler, alert, it's not that good. <laughs> <laughs> It's just like it was a bunch. It was a book written by a ridiculous, misogynistic, yeah, awful for, human being. For all accounts, he sounds like he was a very bad human being. Yeah, exactly. He's just like so, smoking a cigarette and going, "I want a chapter about figs." <laughs> like we need to talk about how just, you need a certain wine with this kind of thing, and then you know. yes, we'll have a cha- a chapter about figs, and then we'll have another chapter where we replace the I with an A. That's basically what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a second. <laughs> Diamonds are forever. <laughs> uh, we'll come back around to our, our ranking of Moonraker overall. Um, let's go through some of the elements. Uh, the theme. Uh, currently, right now, on my ranking, I have it number seven. My rankings are Diamonds are Forever, Goldfinger, You Only Live Twice, Nobody Does It Better, From The Spy Who Loved Me, for much with love thunderball and then moonraker it's just above the man with the golden gun uh it's in that range where i i love the moonraker song but i don't listen to it as much as the other ones and it's going to be pushed further down too i mean there's a vast majority of the ones that are left are going above moonraker there's only a few that aren't going to go uh above it like for instance I'll, I'll spoil this another way to die is going below moonraker but you get like diamonds are forever i think it's an amazing song moonraker it's a good song not as good of a bond theme first of all i like another way to die but uh yeah this this is gonna be on, on the lower end for me i think uh, as callum said the weakest of all of Shirley Bassey's songs, and it just makes no fucking sense. Yeah, down on the lower side for me as well. The only the only song with lyrics that I'd put lower than this is Man with the Golden Gun. 
And uh, you're judging from Russia with Love based off of the instrumental one? Well, both that and Her Majesty's Secret Service. I, I don't class any theme outside of the first one you hear. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's why you're... Yeah. That's why you don't have um, Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang underneath the mango tree, and we have all the time in the we world. That's right. No, because they're not the first one you hear. Yeah. Always the first one to hear is my, is my one. Um, yeah, I'm only ranking the main ones as well. I'm doing all of them. We're gonna, I'm going to be ranking Where Has Everybody Gone and different things. That, that's a catchy song. Where has everybody gone? Uh, the, uh, yeah, the lyrics are nonsensical in a lot of ways. Um, You've got it above the man with the golden gun, though. Is it just because man with the golden gun is so freaking over the top? With uh, <laughs> he's got a powerful weapon just, and all that. I just, I just don't think Lulu's that good. I think you probably could have found better choices than Lulu. Yeah. Um. Again, the music. Other than that, big fan of the score. Love the flight into space. Love the dog scene. Not a fan of the the jokey songs when they get into like they doubt to do the Magnificent Seven type thing or the uh, you know the kind of um, wacky hijinks Looney Tunes crap. If uh, if Bond was a Looney Tune, he would have been canceled. Pepe Le Pew recently got canceled. <laughs> That's what we're recording. I, I, this. I, I, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> On the. Uh, Allies side of things, we've got Money Penny, M, Q, Sir Frederick Gray. We, technically speaking, General Gogol pops up. He's not really an ally on this one. Uh, I'm not really counting the astronauts. Kind of Jaws. I count Jaws as an ally. Dolly? Do we count Dolly? Yeah. No. No, she doesn't do anything. She doesn't. She. She. She's there. Hey, she doesn't even help with the uh, <laughs> with the stuck uh, thing. It's just Jaws. She just nods her head. She doesn't even save a, a line. What about what about what are the guys testing Q's gadgets? Are they allies as well? Do they count as this part of this? Well, of course they are. We just don't know their names. Yeah, one guy's got some uh, pretty impressive balls. Exploding too. <laughs> Bow last Tony. <laughs> oh, we have uh, Manuela too. <laughs> ah. Man, well, uh, she's fine. Uh, Jaws. He helps help on, help on there. Yeah, she's pretty and she helps him. She serves her purpose. The astronauts get killed. Who fucking cares? The captain, such and such. I don't even know his name. Uh, I like that Golgo pops up just to remind everybody, like, hey, this dude, but he doesn't really do anything. I like Sir Frederick Gray and how he's kind of uh, contemptuous. I like him. Um, I love M. Yeah, M's great. Q's great, especially because he's got that line. Money Penny. She's she's not doing as great as she was originally in the series to kind of push her off a little bit here and there, but she's still Money Penny. She's still great. Yeah. Would you uh, give or take Jaws in here? You think that this tarnishes him, or does this? boost him up by making him a bigger character because he's what he's the only henchman that appears in more than one film i like that jaws appears in this film and maybe i know we made a lot of wrestling jokes but maybe it's just because i am i've seen this a lot in the wrestling sphere i'm not opposed to the fact that he's just a goofy baby face now yeah it's just I like the fact that they clearly saw enough in him in the previous movie that it felt like he was somebody worth bringing back. But they turn him into a goof in this movie. So I don't think it tarnishes the reputation because he's still obviously very, very memorable. And I like the fact that he survives at the end of it and gets to leave this movie franchise still alive with someone that he's in love with and can move on into the future, whatever he's doing. But yeah, it's just he's not effective in this movie. Oh, listen, Callum, with the way they're rebooting franchises, we're going to get the Dolly and Jaws series pretty soon. Oh, Richard Kill passed away. I'm pretty Does sure. Mean they can't animate it. Yeah. Or I mean, if I... another giant man play Jaws. Uh, Paul White's not doing anything. <laughs> well, it's the big Jaws. Uh, Chang, not a fan of. No, he sucked. Yeah, he's just there. I mean, I like the fights thing. 
where he's just ah, right you know, kind of a sick match. Yeah, <laughs> because you can't do uh, chair shots to the head anymore. You know. Well, you couldn't seventy nine. Yeah, seventy nine. You could. Well, seventy nine. They didn't do chair shots to the head either because they were, they didn't, they didn't do uh, moves. They did bear hugs, and you Listen, know, bear hugs were very effective. And <laughs> was it you only live twice? Now, if, yeah. you ch- if you did a chair to the head in 79 they'd basically burn the entire building down because they, they would get so much heat it would be unbelievable yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were wooden chairs so you got splinters all in your head back in the day where pro wrestling was like uh, you watch a whole bunch of people gather together to watch a guy punch and they're like oh look at that the oh, no. southpaw <laughs> No, it's just an easier time where if like somebody won with the foot on the ropes, you basically want to kill them and take their entire family away oh, from them or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, why can't, yeah, just like people nowadays, like, why do I have to like dive through a, a flaming table with like barbed wire wrapped around me and stuff like that? Why can't I just put my foot on the ropes and be a heel? <laughs> For the same reason that Bond isn't allowed to be just xenophobic and sexist and easy. Times change. <laughs> um... The other villain in the main film, I mean, there's the astronauts too, the bad astronauts, the, the super race and whatever, but it's it's Drax. Uh, Drax is one of those villains to me that I like, but I can't rank high. I like him better than like Largo, for instance, from Thunderball. And I like him way better than Carl Stromberg. He's way more memorable. But on my list, for instance, I've got uh, Blofeld from Friendship with Love and Thunderball, Francisco Scaramanga, uh, Rosa Klebb, who is, I think, just like far more effective and everything. Like a Goldfinger. He's kind of in the Goldfinger range to me. And Dr. Kananga is, at least right now, he's between Goldfinger and Drax, but I'm probably going to move that around a little bit. I might bump up uh, Kananga above Goldfinger. Either way, Drax is around that Goldfinger type of range, but he's not as good as Goldfinger for me. So I have him extremely low. I have him just above the two Blofelds, the the bad Blofelds. Because he's just another one of these villains in the same vein of Goldfinger, Stromberg, even Dr. No to a degree, that is thinks that he's super intelligent, thinks that he's better than everyone else and then he's completely useless when it comes down to him and Bond I just think he is honestly completely unmemorable like I've, you said he was memorable I just I think the complete opposite I feel like I'd forget about him the next day he's just a carbon copy of Stromberg that he, that's in space and I'm gonna put him right below Stromberg so he'll be pretty much at the end except for Dr. No and Lofeld from Diamonds because like Callum says, he's not very memorable. I think that the speeches that he has makes him memorable for me. Whereas Stromberg, he sits in a chair Can and he doesn't have any good lines. No, Stromberg's, I, I think Stromberg's speech about going underwater is just the same. It's basically the same as Drax's speech about the um, creating a new super race of people. Just don't Before think he's very. Of... God, I just yeah, I just don't think that he's particularly stand out in his characteristics. He's just yeah, just a carbon copy of they're just trying to constantly recreate Goldfinger. Mm-hmm. Or just okay, this guy can't do anything on his own really, but he thinks he's smart and everyone he's richer than everyone. That means that he's super powerful and super intimidating. Just they can't do it though. And to be fair, I don't rank Goldfinger that high because, like I say, he's useless on his own. The ones that I have towards the top feel like they could actually do something to Bond if it comes down to them. Now, but Goldfinger had him. He was just able to talk his way out of it. Well, no, Goldfinger didn't have him. A, t- a table with a laser pointing at him had him. <laughs> well, it's still Goldfinger, and he could have just left Goldfinger. him there Gold- Goldfinger had him in a plane, and Bond beat him easily. <laughs> I guess that's true. But I was going to say, I'm, before the end of the series, I'm going to have to rewatch Dr. No because uh, Callum has Dr. No a little more higher up, up than at least three of these villains so far. So I'm wondering if I just 
got distracted by the quality of the film at the time and i just find it hilarious that he's got hands that can't grab onto things it's just... <laughs> like for me that's memorable i don't have him like super high up or anything like that but it's just like he's, he's clearly ineffective but he's got hands that don't grab onto anything it's fucking <laughs> It's like uh, is way more memorable than Drax is honest. You get like um, a job. You can chuck a gold brick at him and he doesn't move. And Jaws is like, I can bite through like solid steel. And Dr. No, it's like, how do you take that guy out? And it's like, well, if you give him utensils, he probably can't use them. <laughs> like, well, well, you, well, here's one thing about the Drax thing, which I find annoying. So that like they build up the, in the first part of the movie, they build up a, a big part about him is that he has these two man eating dogs. And then they kill, um, oh, Kareen. I don't remember her name. Yeah, they tr- they kill Kareen, and then they're gone. You never see them again in the entire movie. Why aren't they attacking Bond at some point? Obviously, I don't want them to fucking kill the dogs because that's a. That's pro- <laughs> but that's probably why they didn't attack Bond at some point in the film because he would have had to take him out, and he probably right. said no. Well, here's my argument then. Then, why have him in the first place then? Why can't you have an animal that's fine to kill dogs? Why aren't they wolves instead? Fair enough. If you if you're not going to use them, that damn pigeon. Just... <laughs> <laughs> just, it's just kind of like if you're not going to use them throughout the rest of the movie in that sort of capacity, then don't use them in, in the first place. I mean, it's not those those dogs are sympathetic in any way. Regard they just killed a woman. They ate her alive. <laughs> Yeah, but you still don't want to see anything bad happen to animals, Callum. People are one thing. All right, what about this then? What if he just, like, they went after him on the space shuttle and he just locks them in a room? Like, he manages to avoid them, like, dodge dodge out the way, throw a piece of meat into there, and they get locked in a room with some henchmen and they kill the henchmen. Funny enough, if he did that and he quipped, uh, just sit, wouldn't be the only time in the series. There's a future Bond film where Bond literally says to somebody, sit. (laughs) And it's it's not one of the movies you would think. It's a Daniel Craig one. (laughs) It's like, what? Um, I am ranking, uh, I didn't do this ahead of time, but I'm ranking this as I'm going along. Actually, no, maybe I did do it ahead of time. Now I'm thinking about it. I think I might have. (laughs) I probably did. Uh, I'm also ranking the opening sequences. And uh, I didn't do that in the meantime uh, when we were recording the last one. So I've done that since then. So this is how I have the opening sequences ranked right now. Man with the Golden Gun is my favorite because I love the whole introduction to Knick Knack and I love the whole uh, they kill Rodney and that kind of thing. Uh, Then it's From Russia with Love, the fake out of killing Bond. Then it's Goldfinger with the the, the duck. (laughs) Uh, and the um, blowing up the thing and killing the guy and the shocking, positively shocking. Spy Love Me is above that just a little bit, which I'm going to change. Because, uh, oh, wait, no, no. The, um, yeah. Spy Love Me is going uh, below Moonraker for me because uh, I like the action sequence with the plane better than the Spy Who Love Me's. Then I got Live and Let Die, You Only Live Twice, Son of Majesty, Secret Service, Thunderball, Diamonds Are Forever, and Dr. No doesn't have one. So I'm ranking that based off of the three blind mice and fuck the three, three blind mice. Three blind mice. You're there. <laughs> Looking for the cat. <laughs> the cat that's well at the right. Awful. It's going to be weird when you go back if you uh, do rewatch Dr. No, when you get to the time where you get to like Spectre and then you go watch Dr. No and you go, wow, yeah, we did watch all those, you know? Um, 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 um uh, we talked about allies, talked about villains. Let's talk about the Bond girls in this. We've got the super race women, you know, the Vanini Glass Girl, the uh, museum guide. They're, they're nothing. The Apollo air hostess. She does her purpose, you know, whatever. Really, the only four uh, Dolly. What? Dolly's like a thumbs down for me. You guys, she thumbs up or thumbs down? She's not a Bond girl. She's done a Bond girl, yeah. I wouldn't. She's a girl in a Bond film, but she does not qualify as a Bond girl. Bond does not even make a pass. The way yeah, that cool I, bo- I classify like there's two levels of Bond girls. There's like, oh, there's three. There's just girl in background, no character, nothing. Uh, we're gonna have an interesting note about one in the next one. 
about a girl in the background. Um, and then there's like not the real Bond girl, Bond girls. Like Dolly's not a real Bond girl. Dr. Holly Goodhead is the Bond girl. But I consider like Kareen, Holly, Manuela, that like if you've got a character name or you've got lines, I'm putting them in the mix in some fashion. Um, Dolly, see, she's got a character name, but she's see, she's low. <laughs> see, I class the Bond girls as women that Bond either does sleep with or tries to sleep with. Makes some sort yeah. of a pass out at the very least. Yeah, that has to be one of those. It has to be one of those two factors. And I, I, I class like, I mean, there's a couple that don't really fit into that. Or Dink is someone that she pro- he probably already slept with. I'd he say, slaps her on the ass. Like that, that counts. Yeah, I'd say given a chance, he would go with um, uh, Bambi and Thumper. Yeah, probably. Like, that's, like, that's slightly different. He didn't get but, Yeah, yeah. It's just like yeah. If he got, if he had the chance, he would do it. Like I don't class people like the hotel receptionist from the previous movie and stuff like that. They're just not that because that's because he doesn't do anything with them. He doesn't even try. So. So I can't class any of those ones. The, the, to me, there's four Bond girls in this movie. The air hostess, Manuela, Corrine, and Holly. Holly. Yep. And funny enough, I also go by the list of the official list on 007james.com of list of Bond girls. There's only four listed on this movie. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so. I, I'm, I'm going to rack as many as I can because, no, fuck it, why not? I got the... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm insane. I mean, so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I mean, if I go to like all of these ones, like the Apollo hair hostess is towards the bottom end. She's like any one of these interchangeable ones. Like she's basically the same as Log Cabin Girl from Lost. One. Yeah, and she's there's going to be there. another one of them in A View to a Kill. There's going to be it's there's always you know girl who pops up for one scene kind of thing. Yeah, um, Manuela, I put her in like the. Plenty of tall Rosie Carver range of like, oh, she was there for a little while and she's fine. She does the job. I'm happy she doesn't die. She doesn't follow most of the trend of just dying. So that's good. Yeah, thankfully. Corrine is quite, I'd say like she's middle up because she gets a pretty dramatic, memorable death. And it's, it's something that you feel sorry for her about because she just seems like an innocent girl in this whole escapade and she just gets caught up in it and then obviously you have the main one but so holly i put slightly above anya because essentially like we've discussed all the time she's basically anya for this movie except that she is a bit more she's given a bit more to do so i think she's ahead of anya but i wouldn't put her past that point I got her at number three right now. I got Money Penny number one, Fiona number two, and Doctor uh, Holly Goodhead at number three. So she's gonna be number three for me as well, but that's only because like Money Penny is a default number one. Yeah, we all have Money and, Penny at number one. And Domino number two, and then Goodhead because I thought she was really pretty. I'm almost getting to the point where I'm gonna discount Money Penny. Entirely, Money Penny's kind of with an asterisk. Like, yeah, she's she's she definitely a Bond girl, movie. but she's she a him. totally different Bond girl than the other ones. Yeah, and she appears in most movies as one character or another, or one actress playing her or another. So I think it's unfair on all the rest of them. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's for me she out of the quote unquote more real Bond girls in terms of web positioning, she's four for me behind Tracy, Fiona, and Domino. I will say, like, Fiona right now being number two and kind of effectively number one, if you take out uh, Money Penny, she's not going to stay number one. There's, at the very least, there's one more character that I rank above her. Uh, maybe some other ones too, but um, I, I I like Dr. Holly Goodhead. I think that she is a step in the right direction. She She handles herself pretty well. She fights back against Bond's misogyny. And she doesn't just become a total damsel in distress who is pointless. Like she, she's flying the spaceship and she 
takes out a couple guards and, you know. So I, I like her character. She Not only is she very attractive in my mind, but she handles herself better. She somehow also has a better name than Chew Me. <laughs> <laughs> bye <Yeah>. bye. <laughs> and uh, Kareen, I've got like a kind of in that half to towards that middle range. You know, she's kind of like Pat Fearing or uh, like Rosie. You know, she she's the sacrificial lamb of the bunch, and I like her. You know, she's sweet. She's pretty. But she just she serves a purpose to get banged and then killed, so you can't be that high up list on the, the list when a lot of other people have like better characters. Like Aki is a better character, I think, for instance, and I rank Tiffany a better character until she gets stupid, you know. <laughs> but the girls uh, overall, I, I give them a thumbs up for sure. Yeah, it's a thumbs up. Yeah. Uh, the gadgets, we got a lot. We got the wrist-mounted dart gun, the mini camera, uh, the safe cracker thing, the gondola, the bondola, uh, the poison pen, the diary with the dart, the perfume flamethrower, the purse transmitter, the exploding bolus, the sleeping gun turret guy thing, the moonraker laser, the explosive wristwatch, the boat with the mines and and everything. Thumbs up on this. There's just a shit ton of them. Uh, eventually, some of them are some of them are good. You know. Yep, absolutely. Very much to add to that one. Do you yeah, have a favorite. Um, favorite. I would say. I mean, my favorite one is usually the one that's most useful. So it's probably going to be the dart. That's the dart. Where I land too. Crispy. That's the most memorable for me. And then that brings us around to the action and the is humor. Is Jaws a gadget in this film? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. <laughs> action and humor, uh, for the most part, thumbs up on both of them for me. There's downsides, but... I good like action, even the cheeky action, you know, good action. And the humor was very good. I mean, that line at the end... <laughs> That's true. You and more is very in his element with these puns. Yeah, more and Q are great as per usual in the human department. I thought, but yeah, and the action for the most part is very good. But it's but both of them are slightly let down by the on the humor side, the double take pigeon, is just yeah. too far, and then on the action side, the final laser battle is just way beyond my. Like it, it goes beyond even bond levels of absurdity. So ultimately, Moonraker, the film as a whole, is it shaken, not stirred? Where's it rank? To me, I... it's one of those goofy ones that I say it's full blown shaken. It's dumb. There's a lot of weird, stupid things that happen in it, but I think that it's a great watch. It's shaken. I did put it under the spy who loved me, and I guess it for right now it ranks on the lower end of things. It'll end up towards the middle, I'm sure. But it's it's good. It just seems like it's too all right, all right, all right. We gotta do we gotta do space. We gotta get him in space. How are we gonna do this? Fuck whatever we were doing, space. <laughs> and like Eh, it's good, but I don't see myself going, yeah, one of the best. Yeah, it's a shaken for me as well, but it's below Spy Who Loved Me. It's not better than Spy Who Loved Me. It's a carbon copy of the Spy Who Loved Me. There are certain things this movie does better than the previous one. There's certain things the other movie does better than the previous, than the one that followed it. And the other one gets the advantage of the fact that he came first. And now, you have this ranked above Goldfinger. Now, I can't recall because it's been a while. You mean, why didn't you like Goldfinger? I don't think Goldfinger's that... Like, Goldfinger's one of those movies that I feel like people just overhype. Like, I can't remember a huge rapid... It's, it's like one of those things, like, I have Pussy Galore on my girls list, like, not super low down, but she's she's going to be knocked out of the top ten very soon. Like, she's not that memorable. She's, she's memorable because she has that name, 
and the name's the Mike. selling point for her for sure <laughs> and become Bond sexually assaults her and that's basically her character <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it that's, that's basically what I think of it and I don't think Goldfinger is that impressive a, vi- a, a villain overall like odd jobs great and there are bits of the movie they're very good I mean as this journey's going on I mean you can probably tell by the sides of it being there are a lot of Connery movies creeping towards the bottom of my list yeah yeah, you currently have uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, then Thunderball, and then Man with the Golden Gun, Spy Who Loved Me, Moonraker. So you got three, um, three more films out of the four that we've done so far in your top, uh, top five. Five. Right. Yeah, yeah, because I just think that they're overall better movies. That like maybe the more isn't the classic quote unquote Bond. The, the movies themselves are actually, I think, better put together. Can't wait until Brosnan comes in and just fucking <laughs> clears the board. Um, I'm, we'll wait and see it with that, on that front. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I mean, t- in my in my feds, like, all the way from Doctor No upwards, they're all shaken for me. So it's not like they're all super negative in that regard. There's only three movies that I'd say are stirred, and that's the three that I have at the bottom. From Russia with Love, Diamonds are Forever, and You Only Live Twice. Yeah, they're, they're the only free movies. They're the only free movies that I will avoid watching in future. Diamonds Are Forever is just so problematic in so many ways, and You Only Live Twice has a lot of problems to it too. Uh, Rob and I have You Only Live Twice a little bit higher. Rob has Diamonds Are Forever the highest out of the three of us. Um, has said above Limit Let Die. And... It's only my like third towards the bottom. Again, I'm I'm interesting in this uh, stratification that we've got like. Rob is lower on Live and Let Die than Callum, who is lower than I am. We got like kind of a, a split around that, and we got the Honor Majesty Secret Service split. We got Spy Who Love Me is like not too far off. Callum's got the highest for that. Uh two spots above Rob, who's one spot above I am. Uh and Moonraker is kind of around the same range for us. Uh I got it at number five, so does Callum. Rob has it at number seven. Thunderball's a little bit of a split. You and I are close on Thunderball. We're off by two. And then Callum has it two higher than you. So it's like Thunderball is my mid range at this moment. And Moonraker is just above it because I would much rather watch Moonraker than Thunderball. Uh, I think Live and Let Die is a better movie than Moonraker is. So I put that just above that. We're all still. Keeping three, uh, number three is Man with the Golden Gun, which is funny. Um, and Rob and I are uh, Goldfinger and From Russia with Love at number one and number two in some fashion. So that's interesting. Uh, I will say this. Out of all the movies that are left, there are five that potentially can go lower than Moonraker for me. Every other one is higher than Moonraker. Uh, the five, not to necessarily spoil it, but the five that I potentially rank lower than Moonraker, a couple of them definitely, and some of them I'm not too, too sure, are the next three. <laughs> and uh, Die Another Day and Quantum of Solace. I knew you were going to say Die Another Day. Die Another Day is a mess. It really is. It's one of the worst. But I'm not super into For Your Eyes Only. It's easily one of the ones that I've seen the least. I think it's... I'll spoil a little bit about it. I think it's got some of the worst characters. I think it's kind of boring. I think more is a little too old. And it's got funky music throughout the whole thing, which throws me off. And... <laughs> more is a little bit too old than For Your Eyes Only. Then what, what are we looking at? By the time we get to A View to a Kill. More's a little too old in Live and Let Die. <laughs> we're looking at fair. we're looking at Grandpa Bond in A View to a Kill. Oh, absolutely. All right, yeah, like darling. He's, he's he's like nearly sixty. Yeah, he's fifty nine when he's doing that movie. So, for your eyes only, to me, I think a best case scenario would have been that's when Dalton starts, and he doesn't, sadly. So. Uh, Moonraker is the fifth 
for right now. Eventually, it's going to be pushed way down this list because we're going to get Goldeneye and License to Kill and Casino Royale and Skyfall, and it's just going to get be pushed down. But it's one of the more fun ones to watch, I think, because it's just fucking weird. And <laughs> not even weird in the Diamonds Are Forever way where I just hate it for being as weird as it is. It's just, it's fun. I like it. Shaken for me, for sure. And uh, I think that's about it for at least my notes and any other things. I don't think we forgot about anything. If we did, then you know, we'll come back around about it at some point when we're recapping the whole series as a whole. But uh, yeah, tell us your thoughts on Moonraker. How's that rank for you in the comments below and everything else that's happening like that? If you want more of this, we got plenty more coming your way, plenty more movies. And there's a lot of other content here on Fanboys Anonymous. We've got those movie reviews that I was talking about. We've got, uh, we've been, at least right now, we've been doing some Pokemon stuff. So maybe by then we'll have done some more Pokemon stuff too. There's always the Pick Your Poison tier. If there's something you want us to do that we are not getting around to doing, you can always sponsor that. And show us some support and some love over on the Patreon. Even a dollar goes a long, long way and is greatly, greatly appreciated. There are articles that are up on fanboysanonymous.com as well. And I've mentioned a couple times here with the whole baby face turn and everything in the kendo sticks that we've got the pro wrestling stuff that we cover. Smartoutmoment.com is where you'll find all my stuff that's not on the freelance side of things like e-wrestling news and bleach report. These guys also have their own projects and their own things that you guys should be following as well, especially if you're into the pro wrestling stuff. In particular, Rob is all over the place on pro wrestling sites. I am, and the reason we brought up pro wrestling so many times in this one is because we just made it through WrestleMania week. So if we're Hopefully. even alive and you hear this podcast going forward, I thank you for all your uh, eyes on Fightful.com and WrestleZone.com, and I'm sure we have had quite the hell of a week, and... You can follow me on Twitter at Dude Felice and stay tuned because wrestling never stops because we're back in business. Callum, what do you got going on on the wrestling side of things? Nothing for certain right now, but <laughs> in oh, terms the of... power rankings. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the uh, the power rankings over on uh, smartcamoment.com. I'll be writing up those every single week up until the end of time. <laughs> and yeah that's that's the only thing that i can say for certain right now that's going on you can follow me on twitter rigmeister 14 make sure you're ju tuning in on everything we're doing on smart Cat moment on the uh youtube or podcast feeds because i'm sure there'll be something coming up soon that either me or rob or me and tony or some anybody and anybody will end up putting out there which will be great and uh you know, if there's something that you want from either the Smart Count Moment or Fanboys Anonymous side of things, let us know. Donate to the Patreon, pick up some merchandise shop stuff. I mean, maybe I'll put up a... Maybe in the meantime, I'll put up a t-shirt design about, like, Dolly and the braces or something. <laughs> like, you buy a t-shirt if you're like, Dolly never had braces, and buy I one if you... Seen, I've already seen these as I was... Oh, uh, really? Yep. Damn. All right. Well, maybe I won't do that then. I don't want to pinch off of somebody else's idea. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll think of some other ones. I do kind of want to put some Bond related merchandise stuff up. So who knows? By the time you're listening to this, maybe I do have some ideas. Maybe maybe some better ones then <laughs> if somebody else has already taken that. So we'll see. Um, but anything that you do to help support this podcast and this channel and all the other projects that we're doing is awesome, including hitting that like button. So if you did enjoy this, breakdown that was longer than the movie it was <laughs> then uh you know stay tuned because james bond and the review to a kill podcast will return with for your eyes only for real this time mm -hmm.